Okay, all we're going to wait a couple minutes just to let everyone trickle in, the last couple people. Um, we have to gavel in at 10 minutes after when, after one, okay? see a red light come on you're, you've been trained <laughs> done just make sure you All right, everyone, so it's 1.05, so we're going to go ahead and gavel in um, to begin the meeting, and, oh, three times, there we go. <laughs> um, uh, first, the first thing first, we're going to go around the room, and everyone's going to introduce themselves, who they represent, and um, if you want to say your major or where you're from or whatever, you can do that as well. Do you want to start, John? Sure. Well, as she said, my name is John. I am the representation of the College of Fine Arts. My major is music education and vocal performance. Hello, my name is Ambrosia. I represent the freshmen, and my major is international studies. My name is Zachary James. I represent the out-of-state students, and my major is political science. Howdy, my name is Walter Wright. I represent uh, business students and my majors are finance and economics. Hello, my name is Athemio Stephanopoulos. I'm a graduate student representative and my major is uh, Masters of Business Administration. Hi everyone, my name is Maggie Hole. Um, I am Applied Studies representative and I'm currently getting my Masters in Higher Education. Afternoon, everybody. I am Michael Berth, and I am the student body vice president, and I am serving as the tiebreaker. Hello, my name is Colleen Osterman. I'm the student body treasurer, and I'm the chair of the committee. My name is Katrina Miller. I'm the student body president, and I am a non-voting member. My name is Crystal Zacarias. I am representing underserved students, and I'm majoring in psychology. Hello, I'm Grant Day. I'm out representing the Fairmont College of Liberal Arts and Sciences students, and I'm a social work major. My name is Lucas Webb. I'm representing the engineering students, and my major is aerospace. Hello, my name is Ann Moika. I'm a large representative. My major is criminal justice and psychology. Hello, I'm Terry Hall. I'm the vice president for student affairs, and I'm an ex officio member. Hello, I'm Werner Goling, Vice President for Finance Administration, non-voting member. I was a business major. <laughs> Good afternoon, David Miller from the University Budget Office. I'm a non-voting member also and a public administration. Sorry. Um, I'm Lauren Smith, also at the Budget Office. 
I'm Gabriel Fonseca. I'm the Assistant Director of Student Involvement and an advisor to the student government, and I'm going to be taking your minutes, so please speak slowly. All right, so just a few housekeeping things. Um, in a minute, Gabe's going to talk about live stream etiquette and how to use the mics and all of that, so we all know. It looks like you guys have it figured out, but just in case. Um, and then uh, before you, there's a couple of papers. The first one is the procedures that we voted on last time. Uh, if at any point you think that I'm not following them, just raise your hand and tell me. I will try to keep with it, but um, I won't be offended if you call me out. And then the second thing is from the budget office. That is... It is the current account balances for each of the accounts. Um, so we talked about reserve accounts, and that's a little bit tricky to gauge until you get to the end of the year, right? So in your binder, what is called the unencumbered reserves is what is left over at the end of the year. Since we haven't reached that point yet, this is their entire balance. Does that make sense to everyone? So when you look at these, that's not just money that's going to be sitting around. You have a whole third of the year that you need to, that they're going to be spending it within. Does that make sense? But it is a good gauge of where they are right now as opposed to where they'll be in June. Okay. Um, let's see what else. I went ahead and printed off for everyone uh, just the adopted budgets back to 2013. So everyone has a little bit of history of how much has been allocated over the years. Uh, if anyone didn't get that, just tell me and I can get a copy for you when we go to break. You need one? Okay. Um, and then Nancy's coming in, so we'll let her introduce herself in a second. Um, and then I'll let Gabe talk about the talk about the live stream. Sound good? And after that, we'll do opening statements if anyone has one prepared or wants to talk about anything. Okay. Nancy, do you want to introduce yourself? Nancy Loosely, SGA advisor. Okay, so really quick, for those who have never been in a live streamed meeting, um, which is some of you, not all of you, um, the camera is right here and right over there. Um, the lovely people in the back, those two, um, they're the ones who are controlling the cameras. Um, when you are called on to speak, please wait a second so the camera can move to find you. So don't immediately start speaking, like wait like five seconds um, so that the camera can find you, um, so that people know who's watching and who is talking. Um, we do have a captioner, so they are captioning what we are saying. Um, and just keep in mind kind of the same things we do with student government. Um, students, some may be watching, so make sure that you are um, not necessarily on your phones the whole time so people don't, know, so then people think you're paying attention and not not paying attention um, and then just make sure I know that um, David went around and kind of talked to you all about using the mics uh, make sure that you are using the mics because the people can't hear you unless you are talking on the mics um, so that we can go from there are there any questions about live stream etiquette or the microphones or anything like that awesome as the presenters come in some of them may have a PowerPoint so we'll get that set up quickly and then we'll jump into their um, presentations if they have one Cool? Lovely. And like I said, I'm taking minutes, so like don't talk so fast so I can actually type. All right. Um, last week in the meeting, we spoke about maybe having opening statements. Does anyone have anything that they want to talk about at the beginning? And then after that, if no one does, I have a few things that I want to say, but if no one else does, um, then after that, we can open the floor to like questions or just a conversation period or we can recess, so we'll make that decision when we get there. But does anyone have anything they want to say at the offset of the meeting? No? Okay, awesome. All right, well, I'm just gonna say a few things about um, sort of what our charge is here with student fees. Uh, the Kansas State, uh, Kansas State statu Statute 76 essentially gives the charge of student fees to student governments on campus. What that means is that it's our responsibility to allocate the fees that we're, we're given, right? Or that we collect from the students. Um, and I think, I think the Kansas um, State Legislature made a very prudent decision when they decided to give that responsibility, when they decided to give that responsibility to students, right? It's an oversight body and it allows us to have, have some 
say as to what goes on on campus, okay? Um, so, and also the Kansas Board of Regents and their policy, you can go read it, but they echo that charge that the legislature, legislature is given to the students. Um, so it's not a small thing that we have to do this week, but I am fully confident that all of you are up to the task. Um, the other thing that I wanted to speak about um, just briefly is I, um, I, I told this to the, um, to the Student Go Government Association and so I'll tell it to you as well um, just to keep you updated on what um, concerns I have about student fees. So um, a full-time student at Wichita State University pays $678.18 in student fees every semester. This allots to $1,356 per year, and over a full year period, our full-time campus students will pay $5,425.44. Now, part of that $670 fee is not allocated by us. It is allocated by, um, it is part of the athletic fee, and then the, um, oh goodness, the student wellness fee. Um, so, at an average national loan interest of 5.8%, over the course of 21 years, the average student loan payback rate, student, Wichita State students will pay, those who pay back at that rate, will pay $9,395 in student fees um, and interest that they're paying on their fees. So many of our students have an effective interest rate of over 12%. So over the course of 21 years with a 12% interest rate, they will pay $18,604 in student fees. Um, if, a, if a student has a financial outlook of making $30,000 a year uh, for the rest of their life or for a long period in their life, they may be able to handle the cost of fees on their own, but it, could be very, it will be very difficult for them, especially if they get married, have children, have unexpected financial responsibilities. And so as we think about student fees and about the allocation of them, I want us to think about the long-term consequences to the students. Um, the cost of education is a hot topic right now in the current presidential election. Um, and I think it's good for all of us to remember that the cost of education begins at the university. Right, and begins with the things that we put money to, towards. Um, that isn't to say that we don't have good programs that students need, I think we do, and it, it's just to caution you to be prudent as you think about making these decisions. So I think that's all I have. Does anyone else have anything to add to that or? No? Okay. Should we take a recess, Gabe, until, or does Nancy want to present a little bit early. Okay, yeah. Is that okay? Okay, so maybe like a 10 minute recess? Yeah, okay. So let's take a 10 minute recess. We'll wait for Nancy to come back and present, okay?
All right, the Student Fees Committee will call to order. There we go. All right, so we have Nancy from Student Involvement with us, and she's going to present the Student Involvement budget and then um, the Student um, Scholar. Uh, student of the Year Scholarship Competition as well. Um, so everyone, Nancy. Hi all. Um, I'm Nancy Loosely. I'm the Assistant Dean of Students. Good afternoon. I'm Kennedy Rogers. I'm the Coordinator for Leadership Development and Student Involvement. All right. And so today we're going to talk to you a little bit about the WSU Student of the Year um, Scholarships and then the Student Involvement Budget overall. So I wanted to start with, we're on page 78 of, for the WSU Student of the Year Scholarship. And this scholarship um, has existed since 1992 when um, back then the activities office took over what was then homecoming or used to be homecoming um, and changed it to Shocktoberfest. Um, and so these scholarships, this uh, competition was created to really continue to uh, recognize students in their endeavors, their involvement on campus, but serving as leaders across campus. And so the undergraduate scholarship has been around since 1992. Um, in 2014, we decided to start a graduate student of the year. Um, it looked a little bit differently until two, a year ago, um, a little over a year ago in conversations, honestly, I had with student government that we wanted to amplify what graduate students were doing on campus because we got feedback that graduate students outside of research were not being recognized. And so we actually expanded the graduate student of the year recognition process to look a lot like our undergraduate um, process. And so we currently, um, as you'll see on page 78, award $3,100 to our undergraduates through the scholarship competition, and that's just for the scholarships. We have a reception, we have an award that we give them, but all of that is paid through the student involvement budget. And so, wanted to move this out of the student involvement budget, creating it in an EOF fund, since it is specifically for scholarships. Um, this really, it's not a new request as far as new money, um, it's just moving it from the student involvement budget to um, EOF funds so that scholarship money can be in a sense protected and not taken away so that we can make sure that we have them funds for scholarships. Um, the $3,000 for last year and for this year that we have utilized for the Graduate Student of the Year awards, um, we've been paying for out of the reser reserves of student involvement, so that's not money that has come so far in a sense from um, fees. We've been paying for it out of our reserves. and so. It's mainly what this request is. You'll see on there, page 80, the numbers that we've had. Um, since this is a new request, there is no reserve. Um, and I will say that through over the years, we have ended up probably um, awarding more scholarships than what has been allotted because a lot of times we have ties. Um, last year, we had a tie in our graduate student scholarships, and so I made the decision to um, award an additional scholarship. So that happens about every other year that we end up awarding more scholarships than what we actually have allotted because we have um, ties within the scoring system. So um, that's a little bit about, very briefly, about the Student of the Year scholarship um, dollars through EOF. So it's not new money, it's just mainly a transfer and creating a fund for these scholarships. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for Nancy on um, Yes, Walton. So I, I, have, I have two questions. Well, one of them is a clarification. So just to clarify, this money is just the scholarship money. It doesn't include the reception. Correct. At all. And then I have a follow-up. Yes. So the follow-up is how much does the reception cost the student involvement budget? Depending on the amount of finalists, so for the graduate, it can cost anywhere from $800 to 1000 just depending on how many guests they bring as well um, to help cover the cost of the food and obviously making it a celebration of the hard work that they've put in. And so that's just for the graduate one. For our undergraduate celebration, it costs us a little bit more than that because we recognize up to 10 finalists is, is um, the amount, was two years ago in 2018? Mm -hmm. um, we again had to... Um, you know, we wanted to offer an additional scholarship for our students' really hard work. So we had 10 finalists and all their guests. It was a really great evening. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Anyone else? Questions? Okay, um, so I'm gonna recognize okay. myself. <laughs> um, so if it's not new money, if it came out of student involvement's budget and then um, is being transferred into an EOF account, has student involvement's budget been decreased by the amount? Yes. Okay, awesome. Any more questions? No? Okay. So do you want to jump right. into the student involvement yep. budget? So I'll yep. go on to page 84 is where the student involvement budget comes from. Um, knowing that <coughs> we have a, we do a lot of things as student involvement, work with many different areas. We have 10 different functional areas that we consider that we work with. Everything <coughs> from civic engagement, the Cadman Art Gallery, to fraternity and sorority life, student organizations, student government. Um, and so we work with all these areas and this budget supports all of those areas in various capacities. It supports the staff um, that work with all of these areas, advise them directly and all the programs that we do. Um, and within your budget, you'll see last year how many programs we had, the event attendance that we had. Um, and that's just programs that doesn't account attendance because um, the Cabin Art Gallery is, um, we look at attendance a little bit differently than we would at a different kind of program. So we had two goals last year. One was to create a retention plan. Um, and we did over this past summer, we worked as staff to create our retention plan and we are currently implementing that retention plan. Um, everything from sending out emails about how students can best study to making sure that we are looking at trying to increase pay within our student workers um, to providing support for our various student leaders. So we have a comprehensive re retention plan. One of the new initiatives that we started is we started a transfer student social um, that we held for the first time this January. Overall, it went pretty well. We had very good feedback from those in attendance and that we'll look at continuing that each semester because we know we have new transfer students every semester. So um, that was one of our goals, so we're well on our way with that. The other one is our um, strengths program, um, Shocker Strong. Um, so we've had a little over two years. We've been working on this, spent a year developing it this last year and a half implementing it. Um, so we've had some good success. This, this past year, we've partnered with the LLCs to um, integrate it into the living learning communities. Um, and so we've had great success there in making sure that the students are taking the assessment. But then also we call them modules that they're going back in. Kennedy and her staff are going back in a couple times to talk to the students about what strengths looks like and how they can implement that throughout their collegiate career. And so you'll see some of the numbers within the proposal. Of um, We had 300 students complete the assessment last year. This is on page 87. We, as of when this was submitted, um, 520 students that had taken it for this last year, and that's completed. Um, we have more than 1,000 that have actually been sent the um, assessment. We're having about an 80 percent um, take rate, which is pretty good. We feel like overall students that are actually taking, fully taking the assessment. So those were our two goals um, for this last year. For this next year, we're gonna continue on with the Strengths Initiative. We know it's still in its infancy, infancy um, and a lot of the money that is being um, supported by the students who have to pay for the assessment, but also through our reserves. Um, and then um, our Vice President of Student Affairs has given us some money for a graduate student. Um, and so we wanna continue to, to build this program. The goal is hopefully by next year, it'll be in orientation. Um, which we know if that happens, that's a big undertaking to make sure that we get those couple thousand students that are taking it before they come to campus. And then our other goal is about promoting civil discourse and dialogue. Um, we know that with being election year, it's, there's a lot um, of opportunity there for programs and initiatives. And so we've been having discussions with on our staff, um, with one of my assistant directors, Gabriel Fonseca, um, to talk about how do we best um, engage in voter turnout, but also engage in some good deliberate dialogue across our department um, and with students across campus. So those are two of our goals for this next year that I feel like we can fully um, accomplish. So what we're asking for for this year as an increase is um, we're asking for some money for our graduate assistance. And so a little over a year and a half ago, um, Dr. Hall and the chair of the CLESS program, Dr. Farini, talked about creating a higher education and student affairs program, master's level program. Um, 
And so that came to fruition after a lot of work. And so this last year, we've had our first cohort of grads who are in that program, master's level cohorts. Um, just heard from Valerie Thompson, who's the coordinator of that program. We have 18 um, students who are enrolled in that program who are both um, full-time staff working elsewhere, but then also grads um, serving as grad assistants across campus. And so we were lucky enough to be able to hire multiple grads from that program to work within our department. Um, we thought um, we had some money to pay for the tuition for these grads, and we thought that most of the stipend money was going to come through applied studies. Um, that didn't end up working out. There were some changes within the university that that money didn't materialize. Um, and so I made the decision, since we'd already offered the positions to these grads and some of whom were moving here, that I would honor that, that I wouldn't turn them away because that wasn't their fault that the money didn't materialize. So um, I've been paying for their positions out of our reserves for this last year, but I know that that's not sustainable long term. And so the money that I'm asking for is to pay for um, the stipends for these grads. We have five currently in our department. Um, that we would be able to long-term pay for these positions because we know it's such a great learning opportunity for them um, to understand how to work in, within student affairs and all the things that go from them. So that is money that, that's the money that I am asking for is to pay for um, stipends and a little bit of the tuition for these graduate students. Other than that, um, our reserves, You'll see on page number eight, on page 86, how much we have in reserves. And this was, again, when this was submitted, it hasn't changed. Um, our reserves is used for a lot of different things. Um, one, this year we're paying for our graduate students out of that reserves. We also pay for things like um, our strengths initiatives, which I mentioned that some of that has been supported out of that. Uh, we also pay some large vendor contracts that we have to save up over time because um, we don't come to this body to ask for it. One of it is our Galaxy Digital, which is a volunteer ICT um, that we paid for this last year, and then also our Campus Labs um, Engage, which is also, uh, we know it as Shocker Sync. We pay for that contract also over time, and so that's partly why we have money within our reserves to save up to pay those larger contracts that are not built within our budget. And then we did, um, at the end, after the end of fiscal year 19, we gave $25,000 to student affairs to support their initiatives. So that's kind of where some of our reserves go to. So that's really it. That's the only money that we're asking for is to pay for our graduate assistants that are currently in their positions and are planning to come back for next year as their second year of grad school. So that's it. Does anyone have any questions for Nancy? Um, how much does it cost per each strength assessment that you guys deliver via the internet? Sorry about that. Um, it depends. So Clifton Strengths is it can cost anywhere if you go and just get it off the website. It can cost anywhere from forty to a hundred dollars, depending on the level of inventory that you want. Um, with the training and things that we've been able to do, we would get an educator's discount, and so we're able to offer it to students at different prices, again, based on the level of results that they get, in addition to if they want to have individual meetings and materials to help support the results of their findings. And so the minimum right now is $15, and that just covers our cost of the inventory, as well as every student will get some um, information, printed reports. They also get access to the WSU strength specific portal, which they can get access to resources, articles, directly from Gallup, who is the overall administrator of the assessment, as well as a digital copy of Clifton Strengths for Students. Um, in addition to that, some of the um, cost that is associated with that is printing of worksheets and things like that that students can use if they attend a module or if an instructor would like to use it in their course. Yes. Okay, so um, I had a question in the funding request on the um, page 88 for the unclassified salaries permanent. So I'm under the impression that the assistant director of SI's pay um, 
about 24,000 was moved over to SGA, and I was wondering why there's an increase of 19,000 instead of a decrease with that change. So that's explained um, within your packet. So if you'll notice the full time, if you go to the FTE, it's 10.53 instead of 11. So that, um, that 0.4, part of that 0.4 is for the assistant director position that SJ is going to ask for. Um, and it talks about in page, let's see, that when it was put in the position that we got last year um, was not actually allocated into this, right, under seven. Um, the 0.5 position that was approved was not included in our original, in the original request. And so that money was already approved from last year. So that's why you're seeing a bigger increase when it's actually a decrease from last year. Or not a decrease, but it's not changed. Because there was half a position approved last year. And that wasn't included in the request that was sent out. So that's already been approved. And then it is, the point four is um, allocated within, when you look at the full-time FTE, it is for the assistant director put in there. Does that make sense? Any more questions? So as you guys increase the number of strengths, uh, uh, opportunities, those tests that you guys offer, to orientation, what's the projection? Where do you guys want to stop at? Uh, 2,000, 3,000 offers? And also, what evidence do you guys have that students want to take these tests and that they're actually benefiting students that have already gone through the process? So I'll answer your first question. I think um, right now, our goal overall is to become a strengths-based campus. And so there's a lot of research out there that Gallup also provides um, showing how the value of knowing one's strengths and then providing various touch points throughout their college career impacts the growth mindset and retention um, of students. And so it's things that relate back to these are the talents that they're naturally gifted in. How can we as a university support the things that our students are doing and help provide them with opportunities to continue to grow and develop that? That might be, or it might look like um, different opportunities through career de development and helping use your strengths to find internships, co-ops, or maybe going to different fairs and talking to other institutions or other industry leaders who are currently using strengths in the workforce. Um, Clifton and Strengths is actually used in over 93% of Fortune 500 companies, and so we're finding that it's a great tool for students to actually use when they're interviewing or when they're talking with others about internships. Um, so the, I guess I'm answering your second question first, apologies. I get really excited about this stuff, so bear with me here. Um, we also do a lot of surveying, and so every time a student takes the inventory or goes through a module, we ask them to complete a survey that asks them, do you find value in knowing this knowledge? Does this help you reach and achieve some of your academic, personal, or potentially professional goals, so on and so forth? Again, we're in our piloting phases, so we're not seeing like 100% return rate on those surveys. Um, and of course, we're still growing in the folks and the populations around campus that we're offering through right now. Um, right now, as Nancy mentioned, we have had about 850 approximately complete the inventory. Um, beyond that, they have access to the portal and they can do that self-service um, reflection. But if they come to our actual modules that are in person, we have in-depth conversations with them about what these mean, how they want to use it. And again, we extend the survey to anybody who has taken it. And so we are currently accumulating our specific data that's shocker specific, um, but we can always provide additional resource that comes from other institutions or Gallup specifically. Um, and then to answer your first question, I think, again, ultimately we want to be a strengths-based campus, but a great starting point would be to get it through all incoming and first-time students, and that would include transfer students. Um, so I think John was first, so Representative John. I just want to have a clarification. Um, you said that as of right now, you are trying to get um, like more evidence to back that, back what you're saying up, but right now you have not completed, like you don't have full evidence to support this and you're still trying to get it? We have the evidence from our specific assessments or surveys that we have sent out. 
that show on a Likert scale, I find value in this, and also some qualitative testimonial to what they've experienced. So as we've piloted, we're still beginning to collect data on our campus specifically, but there is a lot of data and research out there from other institutions and from Gallup that yes, we do have and does say that this is a positive impact on student life. Representative Day. All right. Um, okay, so on page 88, under scholarships, under other operating ex expenditures, it says that there's a $20,000 requested increase in the my allocated towards scholarships. Could you explain that? Uh, yeah, that's the tuition for the graduate students that we're asking for. So, um, page 86, um, six, um, for additional revenue, where does the additional revenue get used in, or where does it go? It goes to support our different programs and services that we provide. So if we have an event that we have a hypnotist that students get in free, but we can charge faculty, staff, and community members, that money just goes back into help bring additional programs. So it's used to support programs specifically. Representative Stephanopoulos. So I had two questions. One, so when you say strengths-based campus, is the idea to have all 15,000 students at the university eventually take this? And two, um, what's the long-term goal for funding these graduate positions? Because you guys are saying it's creating a master's program. Um, what's the long-term goal to get these positions funded outside of students subsidizing other students? Um, I can answer your strengths question. Um, yeah, I think that would be amazing to have it as an opportunity for any student who comes to Wichita State University to take the inventory and have access to some data that either supports um, their natural talents and the things that they're strong in doing, and then if we can help align them with whatever career path they want to do and help support the university's overall mission, um, then yes, 15,000 and more, bring it. We would love for every student to take this inventory. Currently, it's opt-in, so we don't force any student to take it that doesn't want to. Um, so if it's a part of their orientation packet, they would have access to the inventory. And then beyond that, again, the touch points would be provided for them to engage with and however they can make that work. Um, and then we're working on different ways to reach those students. So in addition to the physical in-person modules, we are working with Blackboard to create a shell so that we can offer the modules virtually so that even if our online students would like to partake in this, we have ways to engage that population as well. And as far as a long-term plan with the graduate students, I think understanding student involvement is an RU-funded department. We get no GU funds at all. Um, and so why we can look at grants and some other things, um, and we are, especially with our strengths area, um, there's not a lot of other ways for us to get funding outside of RU. Um, we can look at revenue, but we don't, we're not like a Heskett Center that has um, a regular attendance for people to come into. So we are set up like an RU fund and that's who we are. So the long term is to be able to get these funded through uh, the student fees process so we can support students in their endeavor in um, having these assistantships as they're in their graduate studies. Yes, Terry. I just want to add a point of clarification. Um, graduate assistance in all the student affairs departments for the most part are paid by, for by student fees. So, so student involvement is not alone of that. When John Lee comes from Campus Rec, theirs are paid for. It's, a, it's just the common practice. And um, those students are service providers. So it expands the opportunity of, of the staff to do more to help students to provide programming all those kind of things. So it's so it's not just paying for a student, it's paying for a, a, a paraprofessional that it c can expand the reach of that department. Anyone else? Oh, Senator Day. Yes, um, under revenue, again on page 88, um, uh, it mentions that in addition to student fees that there will be an increase projected miscellaneous income. Uh, what is that miscellaneous income exactly? Our miscellaneous income is mainly um, it, anything that we bring in as far as events. So okay. attendance at events to um, registrations that go into, I think we have our Cadman Art Gallery has a couple competitions that we offer that they, there's an entry fee 
for those, a small entry fee. So it's any of those kind of things that varies from year to year. Okay. Um, so could you, could you elaborate on the asterisks that you were talking about in question seven? Um, it says for fiscal year 2019, money for a 0.5 position was approved, but it was, did not, it was not included in the approved budget shown on the spreadsheet as the position was not filled until June 2019. The increase in the unclassified salaries line reflects last year's increase. Right, so if you look at FTEs under yeah. 20, it has 9.93. Um, that doesn't account for the extra 0. 0.5 that we got um, because the position was not filled until after the budget year started, the budget cycle started. Um, and so then we went to 10.53 because I have 11 full-time staff yeah. minus the one, so with that position. So that's where the change, the difference is. But was the money still allocated? Well, it was eventually allocated, but it wasn't put in as the 9.93 because that's not, and this is something Lauren and I went and talked through um, before I submitted my budget. Okay. So, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Um, um, I'm going to ask one more. So what is the total cost of the graduate student assistance? Um, we're looking at about 55000 So, but that you notice that that's not the total increase because of the other decreases we've had um, from taking out the student of the year awards to some of the other things. So it's about 55 If we have all five that are currently in there. Any other questions? Okay. Oh, yes. Um, if the strengths based assessments were included in orientation, would there be any changes in orientation fees for your incoming students? At this time, I'm not 100% sure. We are uh, piloting to see what it looks like in orientations um, and what that would look like for every student coming in. And so that would definitely be something to consider or to at least have the conversation about. But as of right now, we're identifying that might be um, the most, mm, what's the word I'm looking for? That's where every student who comes to Wichita State goes through an orientation process. And so we're identifying what that looks like and how we can work with Office of First Year Programs to see how it fits in there. Um, and additionally, again, what a cost point would look like. One more question. So um, how many graduate students is the increase in scholarships and uh, salary supposed to accommodate for? Five. I think that's all we have time for, for the time being. If we have more questions, um, you can email them to me and we'll email them out to Nancy. Thank you, Nancy. All right, so we'll take a six-minute recess and for everyone to regroup, okay? Is that okay?
We're going to call the Student Fees Committee back to order. <coughs> All right. So we have Vanessa from TRIO, and she's going to introduce herself. And then, um, what's your name again? I'm sorry. Kayleen. Kayleen. And then Kayleen can introduce herself. Hello, my name is Vanessa Surya Manirad. I uh, supervise uh, direct TRIO Disability Support Services Program. And this is Kayleen Halber. And I am the Administrative Specialist and Database Manager for TRIO Disability Support Services. So, um, Vanessa, if you could just tell us a little bit about your budget and your request um, for today, why it's important to the students, and even a little bit about the students you support. Okay. Um, so, um, the extra handout I gave you all um, just the highlights of um, TRIO Disability Support Services Program. It is a federal funded program, and we write grant every five years. And um, we serve 115 students annually. We provide the different type of services such as academic advising, graduate school advising, career advising, financial advising, as well as tutoring services. Uh, we also refer students to the various departments like career uh, office of career uh, and as well as uh, financial aid office. And um, over the four years that we serve our st students, this is our grant cycle for 2015-2020. This year's our last grant year, and uh, we provide over 1,077 uh, advising hours for our students, and annually we receive 11,500 of your um, EOF uh, scholarship funding that we receive. Um, in average, we retained 81% of our students with disabilities, um, and 90% of in good academic standing and um, an average of 42% graduate. We also um, give you a copy of uh, the thank you letters that was given to, to us when students received the EOF scholarship. And um, with the EOF scholarship, we provide scholarship, uh, scholarship as well as textbook loan where we purchase books to help students reduce the um, loan debt. Um, as well as employed to student assistance to um, help us with that process. And um, with the help of the EOF funding, uh, really help our students to um, not work more long hours and help, again, help them with their loan debt and help them to stay on task and um, us providing the academic support so that they can graduate from the institution. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, I'm curious. I found some of your marketing materials at the One Stop Office. Mm -hmm. and on the back, it says it's TRIO programs are 100% federally funded. Yes. Um, so can you explain a little bit more about how these EOF funded uh, like programs are different than the federally funded programs that are supported? Um, the EO, again, the EOF uh, that's given to us, we provide uh, scholarship and um, provide uh, textbooks for our students. So we purchase some of the textbooks to put in our um, textbook loan library that was given to our students. Although we're 100% funded, uh, we can't purchase textbooks to help our students from our uh, federal funded monies. And so that's what the EOF money comes from is to provide that assistance and then give them scholarship. Are you also not allowed to give scholarship out of federal funds as well? Uh, they have, we have a designate like um, $1,000 grant, it's called Federal Grant Aid Scholarship uh, from our program that's awarded to us to give to one student. So that's the only uh, scholarship that we would have for our DSS student through our federal funded money. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, yes. So I see on page eight um, mm -hmm. that under goal number one, uh, you have an $8,000 
set aside for scholarships. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you were only able to give away 5,900 uh, the past year. Has that been increasing, um, like the amount given to students from that? So the 8,000, you said, was uh, given to students for a scholarship. We spent 5,900 for scholarship. I thought that was budgeted. That, oh, that was what's budgeted. Yeah, we, we gave more. Um, no, the, do you want to answer that? Yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, so that's the 8,000 is what we had budgeted from year to year, depending on the needs of the students. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we may give more scholarships, and sometimes we may spend a little more on textbooks, whatever. Because our, our, depending on this, we can't really predict year on year after year, like what exactly their needs are going to be. Mm -hmm. So we try to do what can help the most amount of students within our program. And so sometimes we may give more in scholarships, and sometimes we may spend a little more mm -hmm. on textbooks. But our goal is to go ahead and spend the entire uh, amount that's been allowed to us to help the students. So, And then sometimes we wait for um, students that who are, are at risk of dropping out. And so, like, for example, if um, they are at their last semester of school and they need money to uh, pay for their uh, tuition assistance to help with the books or... Uh, sometimes we'll, you know, give that money for the scholarship, de depending on what the circumstances are. So we try to give what we can um, that's allowed it, uh, allocate for for scholarship, but if there's some more monies that we need to give for scholarship instead of books, we would do that. Yes. Yes, Senator Day. Um, uh, this is more on personal curiosity, but um, it mentions that uh, uh, that Trio DSS, as I know, is uh, oriented towards first generation and low income students. What percentage of students would you classify as first generation or low income or somewhere in that category? Um, in our, the page that I gave to you right here. So out of the 115 students in our program, all of them are students with disabilities. But if you break it down into uh, demographics, um, for this year, 2019-20, 44 students are first generation and low income, and um, 27 students are um, low income only, first nine students are low income only, and 35 are disabled only. Um, I have a question. So how has the textbook service been received? Has it, do you think it's helping students as opposed to allocating it to scholarships? Or do you gauge year to year? Um, we gauge year to year. It really depends. Sometimes um, we have a lot of students that put in a request to purchase books because they don't have the money. And so we'll, if, uh, if it's 120, you know, 100 to $200, then we say, okay, we have the money for that, so we'll, give, we'll purchase books for them. But the, the books that's purchased goes into our textbook loan so that other students can utilize it. So it's not actually given to the student, it's to um, purchase, put in our t textbook loan and have other students utilize it later on. But it is very helpful. I mean, all of our students are in need, um, you know, with financial assistance. Mm -hmm. Yes, Dr. Hall. Um, I'd like to um, also add to that, that mm -hmm. um, the College Affordability Committee we have is um, working with DSS and the library to expand the number of textbooks. Thank you. Senator Webb, um, to, to expand the number of textbooks that are that are free and in and places that students can check out for periods of time because, as you know, textbooks are so expensive, mm -hmm. but we can can predict some of those lower level courses pretty easily to have keep on hand in the library and at, at DSS as well. So we find it to be very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Vice President Burns. <clears throat> 
Hi. Hi. I'm Michael Berth. I'm currently the student body vice president. Uh, I was curious if you could tell me a little more about your tutoring services and any uh, charges students may incur by utilizing them. Um, tutoring services, uh, we have, we hire 10 tutors each academic year to serve 115 students. So um, it's first come first serve. Um, if we don't have the money, I mean, we have money allocated for um, tutoring services. And um, so when students request a tutor, they receive two hours a week minimum. And they can have, you know, three or four hours of uh, tutoring that's depending on their needs. And, um, but as far as the, e are you asking if we use that for, from our EOF monies or? No, I was just curious if there was any charge to the students. Uh, I just wanted to know a little bit more about it, which you've answered. Oh, for you, uh, and if no. there was any charge to the students for that service. No. Representative Hall. Hi. Um, I was just wondering, are you kind of capped out at 115 when it comes to students in the program, or can you go any higher than that? I was looking for it. Uh, it might be in here. But 100, 115. Okay. Uh -huh. And that's the what's written in our proposal that we can we serve 115 students. Okay. Mm -hmm. S Senator Webb. Uh, so I was just looking at your handout here, and I was just curious, looking at the graduation rate, does, do you know or does anybody else know the university's graduation rate? I'm not sure. Dr. Hall. Uh, or So um, the six-year graduation rate is um, in the mid-40s, and then the four-year is, is much lower than that. Any more questions? Yes. Representative Hall. Yes. Um, is there a certain amount that students can request for when it comes to scholarships, or is it kind of like you can request up to $1,000 and that's it? Um, with the EOF scholarship mm -hmm. monies? It depends on um, what the needs of the students are. So they put in a request, but I try to give to as many students that request. So I think the mim minimum that I give is like $100, and probably the max is $300. So it's just depending on how many students we have requests, and we try to help as many students as we can. Because I don't want to give them too many, then we won't you know, be able to help as many students as we wanted to. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for coming in. Our next group should be coming in at 2.15. So. to the button.
Welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, just briefly, could you introduce yourselves and then uh, tell us a little bit about your budget and your request for this year? So my name is Becca Yenser, and I'm a co-editor-in-chief of Microcosmos Literary Journal. And I'm Sydney Martin, and I'm the other co-editor-in-chief of Microcosmos Literary Journal. So just a brief introduction for you guys. Um, in case you don't know, Microcosmos is one of the oldest student-run literary journals in the country. It is 66 years old, I believe. Um, and it kind of has a two-prong uh, approach where it has an inherent value as a quality literary journal on its own, but it also offers up many opportunities for applied learning for students. Um, so we have Microcosmos and Mojo. And Microcosmos is the print journal which Wichita State faculty, students, um, instructors, and alumni can totally submit. And we make a one print journal a year and have this big book release party uh, soon, actually, this week. <laughs> um, and then Mojo is our online journal, and it's actually open to anyone in the world. Um, and we have hundreds and hundreds of submissions uh, every semester from different people, uh, publish uh, fiction, poetry, nonfiction online. So we just kind of like to separate them into Microcosmos, the Wichita State Journal, and then Mojo, the online open journal to everybody. Um, so I think we're gonna delve a little further into how the journal benefits the university and the students. Um, and also why our request is just a little bit higher than last year. So I'll let Sydney take it from here. Thanks, Becca. So I did bring handouts for everyone, which I'll pass around. It just has a few notes that we want to just pull out from our actual big uh, document. Thank you. Um, our big document that we sent you guys. Um, so to start, I just wanted to like run through really fast how um, our organization fulfills the goals of the strategic plan of the university because I know this is obviously very important to everyone and then also how it benefits students. Um, so first of all we provide a lot of applied learning experience for all of our students. They get to know um, the publishing industry, marketing, uh, you know, digital media, all of that good stuff. We also provide integrated interdisciplinary experience. So we've been working with the Elliott, Communication, the Elliott School of Communication to develop a podcast for our literary journal, which students can run and work on. Um, and we're also working um, to establish workshops that'll happen in high school to really get students in, interested in creative writing in high school and know that they can submit to micro Cosmos, um, and we'll be working with education majors so they can go in and get experience in the classroom, even if they're really young, you know? Um, so that's good as well. Um, we also have our online journal that Becca talked about that helps students meet the emerging trends in the publishing field because a lot of publishing is happening online nowadays. Um, and then it's um, just a basic research opportunity as well. So in the literary arts, research is essentially cutting apart different things and combining them into a new product, which is what our literary journal is. Um, along with that, students are building a campus culture they want to be a part of. All of our literary journal is a labor of love because our students aren't paid. You know, they're getting this experience and volunteering because they're really passionate about literature and the arts and they want to see this on campus. Along with this, um, we are working to be accessible and di diverse in everything we do. We really seek to publish diverse voices, both on campus and on off campus. We're always talking about who's included in this narrative um, and who are we um, including in this. And we are working on digitizing all of our past issues of our journal as well to make all of our journal um, accessible to everyone. And then finally, um, having a literary journal on campus really adds credibility to the MFA degree that the campus, that the university provides. Um, and with that, you attract a higher caliber of graduate student. And English graduate students are independent instructors for the majority of the composition classes that first year students 
are participating in, right? And so the higher caliber of graduate student, graduate student, the higher caliber of English instructor, and the higher rates of student retention you're also going to see because that's one of their first points of contact when they come to campus. Um, so that's a lot of reasons why we benefit the university. Um, and if you look at your handout that I passed around, um, so I kind of pulled out the ways that students are involved both in distributing the journal um, and are delivering our services and benefiting from the journal. So we have 12 editorial staff of both graduate and undergraduate students who are working as leaders in our organization and they are really working um, behind the scenes to get, get our journal on the ground. And then we have 28 undergraduate readers of all different backgrounds and majors um, that and everyone is able to participate in this as well. And we've had a big bump this year, which was exciting we, with this 28 um, number. Then we also are publishing 12 writers and artists this year. It normally ranges between 10 to 15 writers and artists that we publish um, who are Wichita State students, faculty, or staff. So that's a total of about 52 student, students directly involved with delivering our services. And then down below, um, we have distributed distributed over 500 journals this year so far to students. So this is just past issues of our journal um, through the Student Involvement Fair and different events we've given students journals. They all receive free journals um, because obviously we are funded by students. And then along with this, we've had over 70 students attend Microbrews, which is a recurring reading and open mic event, which uh, Becca can talk about just really briefly. Um, so when we started, when I started working with Literary Journal my first year, I think I was a web editor, but um, there wasn't much interaction between Wichita State uh, Literary Journal and Wichita, which I thought was really weird, like we tend to kind of be in this bubble here. Um, so we developed this program called Microbrews, which is a quarterly reading series um, that we've pretty much had every three months for the past three years. And it's so exciting because we just choose like a different cafe in Wichita every month or every three months. Um, and we keep getting more and more people attending these events and we bring in out of state authors often who have new books and we bring in diverse voices that maybe uh, some Wichitans don't like get to hear. I don't know. I moved here from Portland and I feel like there were so many other literary events there. And when I moved to Wichita, that felt like a little bit of a gap. So it's been really exciting to see um, new people just appreciate and learn about microcosmos and also get to hear uh, this really high caliber of readers coming through the city. So um, that's microbrews and we're excited about it. <laughs> and. Thanks. Um, and so with that, you can see that we've already reached over 570 students this year um, with just directly benefiting from our journal. I also want to just make a quick plug that um, this Friday, February 28th at 5.30 at the McKnight Art Center, um, we will be having a release party and we will be releasing our newest issue of Microcosmos with those 12 students and um, staff who are published and they'll be giving readings of their work too. So that's really cool. So just tell everyone you know about it. Um, but okay, so now getting down to the changes in our budget, I made this table just so you could see. Um, there's not a whole lot of difference in what we requested from last year, but I wanted to explain why a few of the numbers have changed. Um, so first, the first change is that second um, row with submittable. Um, last year we requested 240 and this year we requested 300. Submittable is the management software that is the industry standard for all literary journals to use. It just allows us to receive submissions and go through submissions of all of our um, writers who send stuff in. And so just the price has gone up just with what, um, how much we're supposed to pay every year. So that's why that changed. Um, and below that, so last year they requested $500 for a professional writer to come in um, and speak to students. Um, we actually have just done some, um, I think, discerning of what our priorities should be priorities should be as an organization and so we're actually not going to request that for this next year because we really want to focus on making sustainable processes that we already have within our organization before we you know keep adding on more projects um, so that's why that changed other than that um, writers payments and mailing costs both went up just a little bit just because we're growing and we are publishing more people and so we need a little bit more in our budget to actually pay our writers and to mail contributor copies or send contributor copies 
copies to our different contributors. Um, so those are the few different changes. Um, the total costs actually go down because we aren't requesting that $500 for the professional writer tutorial. And so our total cost will be $4,000 and $10 to operate for this next fiscal year. Um, and we're requesting 3,675. It's just a little bit more than last year um, because they carried over a balance of about 2,000 from fiscal year 18. And so they were still working with that in their budget last year. But after paying all of our writers and getting our book printed, we're not expecting to carry over any money into the next fiscal year. Um, so that's what we had for you guys. Please let us know if you have any questions for us. Are there any questions? Uh, Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, who's the budget review officer for your group? Was it not on the, sorry, was it not on the um, form? I know that, no. uh, sorry. Um, so Jean Griffith is our budget officer. Um, and budget review officer, I'm sorry, I don't know why that's blank. What is it? It's probably Andrew Hippisley. So probably. I don't I don't know that. Sorry, thank you for that. Um I do know that's who it was last fiscal year, so I'm sorry that I left it blank. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, uh Pres President Miller. I just had a clarification really quick. For submittable, that's the, um, that $300 request, that's for the entire year, correct? Yes. Senator Zacharias. Um, are there any other revenue um, sources that you receive? Um, yes, so we do actually, so every year we hold a microcosmos contest, um, and with that we have um, donations from the MRC um, with about $1,000 every year that they donate to us to run that contest, so we didn't actually um, include contest costs in our budget because that's funded from an outside source. Other than that, we do receive some money from our contest submissions because people have to pay to, um, to get into our contest. It's hard to project about how much that will be um, and so we earn a small amount, amount of money from that um, and then we also have put into place um, an option for next year where um, different surrounding businesses and organizations in the Wichita community area can sp help sponsor the journal and then they'll get an ad published in the back of our book we weren't able to do it this year um, but it is in place for next year representative Stephanopoulos um, are you guys classified under a particular division of the university, or are you a separate entity? Yeah, so I know we're under the English department, but we don't receive funds from the English department. Any other questions? Uh, President Miller? So for next year, do you have uh, a goal of um, sponsors for the journal that you just mentioned? Um, I'm not sure if we have a certain goal that we'd um, we talked about yet. The hard thing is with graduate students running the journal, there's turnover every year. So it'd have to be something that the next editor-in-chief um, would decide. But I mean, we definitely work with them to help them figure out like what a good achievable goal would be for that first year of sponsorships. Representative Stephanopoulos. Because you're under the English department, do you have certain restrictions that prevent you from raising revenue or anything like that? <laughs> uh, we're not exactly clear on whether there is or isn't a cap on that. I'm sorry. Any other questions? We have time for one more. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in and for describing your request to us. Thank you. Thank you for having us.
we're going to take a 10 minute recess.
Um, if no one objects, I think we'll get started a little bit earlier. Are, are you good? Okay. <laughs> All right. Call back to order. <laughs> Um, all right, so we have the Office of Diversity and Inclusion here, and Alicia is going to tell us a little bit about her budget. Um, Alicia, could you introduce yourself and then tell us about your request? Yeah. <clears throat> yes, absolutely. So good afternoon. Um, as Colleen said, I'm Alicia Sanchez. I have the privilege of serving as the director in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, and the budget officer pronouns she, her, hers. So I'll go ahead and delve in. We put in a student fees request to refund our LGBTQ coordinator salary, as well as an additional request to pay for Passage to Success program expenditures. Give you a little bit of background and some highlights on our LGBTQ coordinator. This last year for, let's say I think, our LGBTQ coordinator transitioned out of our office as a full-time position. We felt at the time that Brad Thomason left, we wanted to leave that position vacant and evaluate, um, making sure that we're hiring for someone. So that position was vacant by a full-time professional, but we did hire a um, grad student to come in and serve in the grad position over the last year. Um, some of the highlights that um, over the last three years since 2016 of having that coordinator, um, our overall campus pride index, which is an, an indicator of a college campus or college campuses across the U.S. in terms of their performance, their LGBTQ um, inclusiveness. And so we have increased that score in the last five years from a two stars out of five to four and a half stars out of five now. And that looks at our policy inclusion, our support institutional commitment, um, academic life, housing and residence life, campus safety, counseling and health, and recruitment and retention efforts. And I'll highlight that our institutional support is 4.5, and the biggest driver for that is having a full-time professional within that position. Also, our recruitment and retention efforts, um, which correlate with that position, are five out of five stars as well as our safety. So we appreciate the work that our UPD does on campus. Um, some other highlights we hosted for the first time in Kansas in the history of the Midwest, um, let me give you the whole acronym, the Midwest Bisexual, Lesbian, Gay, Transgender, Asexual College Conference, Mumble Tech, which many of you may have heard of in 2019. It was the first time it was held in Kansas. And so we had a 1,000 students from all across the Midwest um, come to Wichita and, and, do, and we were able to host that conference, which the coordinator was really the driving force behind that. Um, some of the program initiatives, when we look at, um, we've increased the number of programs that we can provide. Um, prior to having an LGBTQ coordinator, we were doing this work already. Um, we just wanted to make sure that we had an identity-based position so that students who identify as LGBTQ or allies could see themselves. Because unfortunately, there's not any way, any sort of indicator for us to determine how many students identify as LGBTQ. It's not any sort of data point that we collect um, on behalf of the entire university. So students have to really kind of self-select and if they don't see that position outright explicit it's very difficult for them to be aware of some of those um, services and so as a part of the 2015 and 2019 climate study those were some of the things that came out about some of the programming we were doing and then also the really the need for that LGBTQ um, coordinator again looking at a student driven feedback. Um, some of the programs that you might be familiar with, and I know you have a handout there, um, has speaks specifically to LGBTQ programming and our coordinator, and then also um, Passage, which I'll get to. Um, but game night, so again, having an opportunity to have social identity-based programming, our gay pro events where we bring in keynote speakers, do other programming um, for our LGBTQ+, a lavender graduation celebration, so again, providing a cord and recognition, because oftentimes it's more um, support-based, and our students want to be able to celebrate the success on campus. We also have our LGBTQ ambassadors, so again, identity-based students. So when our campus is looking to bring um, recruitment efforts for our Gay Straight Alliance student groups in the high schools, we have ambassadors that can speak to those student groups as well. We have a task force that meets um, throughout the semester, which again highlights several um, different areas on campus with faculty, staff, and students because again, this position, um, while we are very student-centered and that's our primary constituent group, do want to be able to support faculty and staff being education and awareness. 
through our climate study, some of the results reflected that students want to see their identities reflected in campus activities and events. Certainly with this position, that would do that and has been able to do that. Because we've had a coordinator and a coordinator, excuse me, a grad student, that person has only been in our office 20 hours a week. So some of the services and the support we've been able to provide, we've seen a little bit of a decrease just simply because of the nature and the volume that our office can produce, um, but certainly still an important identity-based group that we want to serve. Um, again, some of the other initiatives that we've been able to work on as a collaboration across campus is the name change procedures, so making sure that our students who um, have a preferred name have the ability to go online and change their name. And so if they have a chosen name they want to use on their ID card, their shocker card, within the class roster. So we've been able to help students navigate that process. Also provide assistance if they want to legally change their name because it's very cumbersome if you have to change your name legally. Um, the cost, of course, we don't provide any sort of financial support for that, um, but $200 to go through a name change process when we know as students there's so many other costs. So we help navigate students through that process and, of course, help faculty understand the need for the correct pronoun usage and chosen name as well. Um, so again, as we move forward, our hope is, is that we'll be able to continue to provide the same level and increase um, looking at some of the subgroups. So when we think about our queer students of color, that's a population that on our campus is even smaller. And so how do we make sure that those students see themselves reflected in our programming? Transitioning to Passage to Success. So for those of you who are not familiar with that program, um, it is a four-day program where you bring first-year students to campus the week before classes start, and it gives them an opportunity to really have a chance to get connected to campus. We want to make sure that they feel connected, they have a chance to explore the city and our campus, that they meet other faculty, staff, and students that look like them. Again, it is very based on our underrepresented minority student population. Of course, we don't turn any student away. It is open for all students. Um, they move into the residence halls early if they are living on campus. Meet new friends, of course. They are connected to a peer leader that helps get them connected. So they have little squads of eight to 10 students. And so really focusing on that sense of community um, for them and help them navigate. So we do a classroom finding service. We go out into the community to do service because again, we wanna get them um, prepared for some of the activities that they're gonna do on campus. Learn more about resources. We do some um, academic success um, workshops as well, time management. Um, we feed them, so when they move into the residence halls, the timing does not allow for the residence hall for the dining facilities to be open. And so this is really where the biggest cost comes from. So we have, um, we feed them three meals a day and then of course snacks. We wanna make sure that food insecurity does not become a problem. So from the time they get with us on Sunday evening until Wednesday evening, we're providing meals for them throughout the entire time. So. 10 meals are provided throughout this. The cost of the program is $50. That certainly does not provide enough support for um, that. It, that $50 doesn't cover the program. It costs about $250 per student to be able to do that, and we have the ability to accommodate 100 students. Um, with our overall budget, we, um, in order for us to maintain that program, um, because of the success of students, when we look at retention and um, grade point average, over the last three years, we're seeing success greater than students who are not participating in that. So in the last three years, um, data, so 2016, we had an 82% retention rate, and the average GPA was 3.17. 2017 was a 83, not 30, <laughs> no, that would be that, an 83% retention rate and a 3.03 GPA um, for first year students, and then 81% retention rate in 2018 and a 3.07 GPA. So again, our numbers are showing that students that participate in this pr program right now are being retained at a higher rate than our other students on campus that are not participating um, in the program. Um, because of the success of the program, this is an indicator that has been included through um, the Kansas Board of Regents. So as we look at, is, at different initiatives, um, the provost office has included this program as a key performance indicator for us as we move forward. And so certainly we have to evaluate how do we again continue to provide this program. It costs $25,000 for us to do that. And so we're looking for the opportunity for support to be able to cover the expenditure which range from food, primarily is our largest um, expense with that, 
um, overall postage to mail out um, as we continue to grow recruitment around the I-35 corridor. We're seeing more students, so we just sent out a mailing to 2,500 students, um, under uh, minority students. And so when we look at that number, again, just sh the sheer volume of what we're doing in phone calls, um, again, looking at that experience and making sure that students are able to um, relate and have all the, you know, things that they want. So the swag, so T-shirts, bags. Um, we try to, again, keep material very small in terms of what we're printing. We give them a, a zip drive. We try to do as much as we can and have had great community partners that have been able to help us um, over the years. But again, as um, we're competing amongst multiple campus departments. It's becoming more and more challenging to find corporate dollars as well as the sheer volume when you get to 100 students that are participating and we have about 20 students that also support the program throughout it. We're asking for food donations for 120 people and so for businesses it's very difficult for them when that's a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars that they would be donating to the university. So we're looking at a funding model that would hopefully alleviate some of that and so some of them do provide a discounted rate and they charge us half price for the meals so anything that we can do to be good stewards of our limited dollars we certainly do. Okay so I know I've just given you a lot of information and I'm sure there are some questions so I'll go ahead and end there and uh, turn it back over to whomever's facilitating to start the Q&A. All right um, does anyone have any questions? Yes Representative Fole. Um, when do you plan on starting the search for the LGBTQA plus coordinator? So we, uh, I just had that conversation with my supervisor, Dr. Austin. So our goal is to um, evaluate, because we just received the, so the succinct answer, Maggie, is to evaluate the climate study and repost it as soon as we possibly can. So here in the next couple of weeks, so then that way we can go out to NASP and some of the other national conferences to then hopefully yield a strong candidate and onboard them as soon as possible. Ideally, really my hope would be um, mid-April, early May. Representative uh, James. So when you talk about the academic success, um, do you also provide stuff like um, tutors and does that have a cost to the students that are going through passage as well? So for Passage to Success, how it works, that program itself, we start and then funnel student to pass. So that was a separate request through EOF and that we were able to, to do. And so that funding, we do have mentors and tutors. So the, the student staff, I will say, that are hired through Passage, that's not included in the, in the expenditures that we have. They're funded through the EOF piece. But we do provide tutoring services and academic support for those students. So um, the hope is, is once they come through passage they they have to opt out we have more of an opt-out model so students that's a little bit more difficult for them so that we can can help um, maintain and retain them so yes representative right yeah I was just wondering um, how long the LGBTQ coordinator has been a position within ODI um, since 2016 was the first academic year that we had so 2016 17 18 um, and then we've just been out without it this last year. Okay, thank you. So, I'm sorry? 17, yeah, thank you. Repre Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, first, your format for this funding request is not the standard one that was requested for this year, and so it omits um, other outside funding sources, and you alluded to corporate dollars are hard to come by. How do you go about finding outside revenues, and how do you go about um, establishing what revenues, and what other revenues do you bring in? Sure. So at this point, we have not been able to secure any corporate funding for this. I have made several um, asks we're working in conjunction with the uh, foundation. So we've gone out to Spirit and to Cox, as well as um, Cargill, to make a request for funding, um, but have not received any sort of funding for it. Right now, it's been piecemealed funding from the provost office we've received um, over the years, about 3,500, um, the um, Division of Student Affairs has provided $3,500 as well for it. Um, and then again, we work with various food um, vendors. And so that's really where the, the, the bulk of some of the costs come from. Um, but as this program has grown 
in its first year in 2016, let me make sure I'm getting the right dates here, we had 36 students participate and now we're at a capacity of a hundred students participating so the cost for food has grown and so um, some of those food we've worked with Molinos um, a local caterer we've worked with Carabas um, Chick-fil-a um, Good Sense um, Jody B, Jimmy John. So those have been some of the people that have been willing to either do 100% in kind or done 50%. Does that help? Does that answer? Yep. Okay. Any other? No. Uh, Senator Zacharias. Um, so the program fee of $50 is for the upcoming 2020. Um, program has that been changing at all um, since its start in 2016 or has that been consistent throughout the years so we decreased it it was initially $65 and the number of students that were contacting us again the target population that we're we're targeting was asking for scholarships so we found that we were scholarshiping more students and so we evaluated the volume of calls and decreased it based on doing a focus group with the participants to find a, a dollar amount um, that students you know felt a little more comfortable with doing we still scholarship about 10 students um, every year so we again and by scholarship we just eat that cost and it's about $500 um, because there's not any sort of scholarship dollars at this point yes Dr. I, Hall. I just want to jump in and um, Alicia knows that I'd like us not to have to charge anybody because we don't want the cost to stop students from being able to be in this program. The challenge is there, there's a balance between having a little bit of skin in the game and you're more likely to come than if you don't pay anything and you just, you just sign up for free. And so that's where the $50, I think, yeah. is what they reached is that, yes, they can scholarship those who think 50 is still too much, but for others, it's a reasonable level that you say, I paid $50 for this program, I'm going to go. The other thing I will add is we also evaluate based on the cost of orientation. So one of the things we wanted to do was to evaluate this year, could we increase it? Um, the orientation fee doubled, unfortunately, this year. So we weren't able to compete and make it so we weren't pricing students out because we don't have any control over that. So in addition to them paying the $50, those students that come to this program then pay $150 the next two days after the program. So essentially they pay $200. And so we're trying to be very mindful of our cost, not to price it out for students when we think about the larger, um, the cost that, uh, that's associated with it. Um, Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, I had a couple questions about the LGBTQ uh, coordinator position. Mm -hmm. So you said that um, it was vacant, uh, vacant for part of 2019 and then you hired a grad student to fill in part-time. What happened to the rest of the undispersed salary and uh, where did it go uh, if it's not accounted for in the unencumbered reserves? And also for the 2021 budget, um, there's nothing budgeted for um, the employee health insurance. Maybe the budget office could enlighten me about the hiring practices if gotcha. that has to wait too. So the first part of it, so the but the salary for um, it, that salary is still committed to the LGBTQ coordinator. So once we hire, knowing that we were going to hire in someone this spring, so whatever that salary that's there that's committed to that position is still sitting there. And then those dollars would be used. So if we hire someone at the beginning of April, then the, those dollars would be used. Um, we did expend part of the salary because the individual was still here for a portion of the year. And then we were able Able to use um, our other budget dollars through our state funding for the um, grad students because again our, our hope was to be able to hire someone still during this academic year with the dollars that had been dispersed so that's the first part the second part I believe was an oversight and I don't know that I was aware that I missed the but the 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 benefits piece because I believe for health benefits for an individual range I want to say 10 5 10 8 on there so Thank you for bringing that to my attention. I don't know if anything, Lauren or David, that you would add. No, I, I would agree. Um, would you um, want to amend your request to include those health benefits? Is that? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it. I would. <laughs> <laughs> um, so very quickly, uh, did could you also provide us with the reported reserves? So there were a couple of questions um, that were omitted, and I don't know if it just got lost in translation or something, but um, if you could just provide um, me with the reported reserves, sure. and then I'll push them out to everyone else. Okay, I can do could. that. Yeah. Um, and then I believe for the salary, that's the for though for that salary position because mm-hmm. that would be the only funding that we had. It was approximately fifty five thousand. Okay. Just so everyone has that number now, and I can get you the exact number. That would be wonderful. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yes, Representative Stephanopoulos. If you're uh, going to pull those numbers, can you also itemize how much of the salary wasn't spent and is still remaining, um, and so we can understand how much is still within the reserves that will be applied to the next position versus how much you're requesting for the position overall, just sure. for regularly funded. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can do that. Um, and then also one other question that was on the budget request, and I think you might have gotten last year's budget like okay. request. I think that's where the confusion is happening because it's looking like last year's form. So I think that might have been, there. Must something must have happened. But um, so one other question that was on it was, um, how, if you receive uh, funding from outside of student fees, how much, and then sort of just a simple breakdown of how it's allocated. Um, so if you could also send that to me, that would be great. Okay. And then I'll send it back out to everyone. So just well. our overall funding for our yeah. department. So just overall funding, yeah. Okay. And it doesn't have to be super specific, just if you are already have a budget request for someone else. Okay. You know, yep. Pretty simple. Yes. And so the updated amount for that request, if you all want to update your um, page, would be $80,637. And that's just assuming that it's the same, estimating the same as last year, because it just depends on whoever they hire, what their selections are. $80,637. And I can get updated spreadsheets out to you. For one more question, yes, Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, for the item number three, outline goals, outline goals and objectives mm-hmm. of the program. Um, this is similar to last year's request, and um, it says that under item six, for the students that you represent, you say all WSU students. How do you propose to uh, reach online students, hybrid students, students that are out of state? And uh, what about the website? When you go to ODI's website, the LGBTQ coordinator link doesn't work. It hasn't worked for probably about four months since I've been watching it. So first I would say, so anytime for all of the students that we serve, um, it, it's a couple of different things. So with our um, grad student right now, um, they've been doing outreach. So we have access to what's called the Student Success Collaborative. So we can send out messages to students and target students um, and let them know about services we provide. And that goes to any student that's enrolled. So whether you're an online student, an on-campus student, there's no differentiating. We can see who is or isn't online. And so again, making sure that there's opportunities for that. We have in the past, um, depending on the space, um, and the type of programs, when I say space, it, I'm, I'm referring more to the type of programming that we're doing. So with our LGBTQ support group, we don't stream those online. So when we've had speakers, we try to build it into our contract so that we can do streaming or we can do other videos. So that's one piece. The second thing, um, with the LGBTQ coordinator, what, or not the coordinator, excuse me, with the website, again, it has been a priority. I have one like a quarter time person that works on our website. And so not that it's not a priority, but again, we're trying to go in order of of everything to make sure. Um, And so we have handouts that we make sure that we provide. So similar to what several of you received before our ODI brochure that talks about the services and resources. Um, Things change so often that oftentimes when students come in, it's that one-on-one connection, but we do know that uh, the online presence is extremely important. All right, thank you so much yeah. for coming in. You're welcome. Um, and for presenting to us. And I'll follow up with you, Colleen, on the other okay. intro. Okay, sounds good. Thank you.
great. Our next presenter is Dr. Terry Hall, um, and she's going to talk to us about student affairs. Um, so I'm going to turn the uh, mic over to her and let her explain a little bit about it. Thank you very much for the chance to be here today. And as I start, I, I want to say that I've really appreciated the, the quality of questions and the in-depth way that you have looked and have questions about the budgets that are coming up. It's, I can tell that you've done your homework and it's, and it's very much appreciated. So thank you all for the, the work that you're doing on behalf of students. So my, the student affairs request is on page 153. Um, and you'll see what it is that, that the, the bulk of this money, um, just under half of it goes to, to fund a program that we called Leadership, that Representative Webb was with us last year for this, Representative Hole was with us this year, and um, hopefully if we'd asked them, they'd say it was a pretty neat experience and that they, sh they would want other students to have that experience as well. Um, another big part of the money, the $100,000, goes to help fund students who are traveling to leadership experiences. Um, as you know, there's a funding line in student government that, that often goes toward funding of, of individual travel to conferences to make presentations. I believe that funding students to go to leadership conferences for their groups um, benefits the university in, in a great way. That this past weekend that um, at the Big 12 BSU conference, um, Student Affairs paid for 12 registrations for um, students to go and attend that conference. And um, just last week I talked to, um, there's a group, black engineers that want to travel to a conference as well, so I'll help cover some of their registration fees because um, these are critical ways for students to get internships. This past fall I helped fund the Hispanic um, Society for Professional Engineers that went to Las Vegas. And of that, the six that went, um, again, helping support, then we helped with, with uh, plane because it was cheaper, that of the six, four came back with internship, and Tony Ibera is in working with Delta right now at a year-long internship. And so those kind of things are, um, I never turn down students who come and say they'd like to travel um, because I think it helps them as individuals, it helps them as they come back and they work with their groups, which ultimately makes for a stronger campus community. And so I'm, I'm, I'm a big supporter of student travel. Other um, money is also used to support major student events. The Miss Vietnamese um, pageant was this past weekend, and so I helped pay for some of the tech fees for that. I always support Miss Latina. I always add money to uh, Miss Black and Gold as well, because you know having um, big programming on campus, especially on weekends, again, adds to the, the campus community. So, so money goes there as well. A new thing that we're adding this year is um, uh, buying academic planners for all new students that then would have key resources for the campus on it. We're hoping to have some strengths um, information in it as well, but really helps will help um, be a resource to new students. Again, hoping, hoping to connect them to campus, but then also helping them figure out where they need help and they can find it based on some of the information that's in those planners. They were done here a number of years ago. They were done at my previous campus and were, were quite popular that after the first year often second and third year students wanted to come and get them as well because of the cool, the cool resources and, and things that are in that. So those are the, um, oh and then I also have been helping to support the Graduate Student um, Council doing some of its, its, pro, its programming as well. It, it's um, especially for our graduate students here to have opportunities to gather and um, support each other um, it is, we found to be critical. And, I, and frankly, I've been, you know, I've been to two other schools working in, in graduate schools. Um, I think the need for our graduate students to socialize is different here because they're from my experience, there isn't the same kind of program level de interaction that there is on other campuses. Not necessarily true for the program that Maggie's in, but there are other, there's, there are a lot of our graduate programs that don't have a lot of identification, identity, and don't spend a lot of time together socially offering support, you agree? And so um, any way that I can help um, support graduate students to find the community here um, across the spectrum, if not in their program, is what we've been using some of that money to as well. So that's, that's what I, 
it's, it's a pretty simple little budget, um, but I'm able to answer any questions that you have about anything I've said or other questions. Thank you, Terry. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Uh, Senator Wright. Yeah, so I just have a clarification. So half of your budget goes to leadership. If, if I remember right, that used to be under the student involvement. No, nope. it's, that's... it's always been in here. Okay. So this, the Summer Leadership Institute is a different program that's oh. in that budget. This is leadership that takes place in January. Okay, so I'm just confusing the two. Thank yep. you. Senator Day. Okay, so on page 154 on number seven, you mentioned that you have $23,000 in reserves and right. that you plan to use the reserves to pay for students with disabilities. Could you elaborate on how you plan to do that? So um, I've used some of it already, but I'll use some more as well. Um, for example, one of our goals for the Division of Student Affairs this, this year has been um, bringing disability services into the 21st century. And one of the key resources that we didn't have were some of the pens, the note-taking pens, that, that students, we, we bought some with those, but we want to buy some more of those pens. There are other kinds of adaptive technologies that um, we'd like to buy for some of our students with, with disabilities as well. Um, disability services is a GU funded area and certainly we have hopes of um, putting in a request for some more items to support that office and to get funding for a permanent another permanent interpreter because we paid for that out of monies here and there this this past year but um, we're up to 15 students who are deaf and then we have two to three graduate assistants and then we also support three faculty members who are deaf as well and so uh, the more interpreters that we can have on our on our staff the better um, so we've had one temporarily and then we'd like to have her be permanent that we'll put in through a, a budget request through GU Uh, Representative James. So um, you talked about how you basically sponsored um, 12 students for the Black Student Union Conference, uh, the Big 12. And I remember that they came to SGA looking for funding. How come it wasn't like fully funded? If you can answer that. Because I know that it says there there's remainder of that 20000 um that you have like left over. How come it wasn't fully funded? I'm... I'm I'm trying to be fair in the process, and usually the cutoff point about what I give to, to students, not what I, but what, what we, we allocate to students who are traveling are in that two to $3,000 range. Because if I get much more than that, there's going to be no money for anybody. And so, so often we look at um, probably about a $2,000 cutoff, and that either comes for registrations, or for in this case, BSU was more than $2,000 because of the 12, and then, um, or we, we do pl plane tickets for them and so we just try to make sure that we we cover enough that students are able to go but still then have more so that other students are going to be able to travel as well uh, representative Stephanopoulos um, when I go to page 153 yes sir and I see goals one through four the total amount requested from those is 95,000 but the total disbursements that you say will occur is 80000 versus the total amount that you're requesting is $100,000. Um, so that's about 15% uh, reserve mm -hmm. that's, uh, you know, overall, and then 20% total as what's, uh, you know, reserved left. So can you give us a breakdown, maybe email Colleen or somebody with the full disbursements for that $20,000 yeah. and where that goes? Because, you know, now actually, um, I'm glad you pointed that out because as I started going through all the different groups that I've supported through this budget in the last eight months, it's, it's more than what, what I've, what I've, set, what I've allowed for here. So I'm happy to provide that information to Colleen. Thank you. And could you email it to Gabe as well? Just so that we have Do I have to? KCCM. Right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, I will email it to him as well. Uh, any other questions? Oh, uh, Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, we've heard from different groups, such as the Student Involvement Center. They gave you $25,000. In a previous meeting that we had at the ODI office, they said they received $3,000 from you. Can you talk a little bit about how you accrue those monies or you request them from departments beneath you and how you disperse them to other departments beneath you? 
Well, uh, you know, w one of those examples that I that we redispersed some of that money was to some of those pens I just referred to. Um, the reason that I asked Alicia Sanchez to come and ask for money because I wanted us to finally have a permanent line item in her budget that talked about and will institutionalize the passage to success program because it's so important. Up until this time, it's been um, her going around to bed, you know, begging for money and doing things. And so, so yeah, I've, I've given money toward food or this past year, um, I, we paid for the bulk of the food that she paid for by Chartwell. So I'll add that into the 10th, the, 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 the breakdown as well. And so, um, I also help support other initiatives, especially if there, there are food or things that we need to do. Um, staff often come to me and say, could we have an additional $2,000 to do X, Y, or Z? And um, I'd like money not to be an issue for us, not to try an initiative that I think is going to help students. And so that's my job to help find that money. And that's, and that's what I try to do. Any other questions? Thank you, Terry, You're so welcome. much for coming in. There's no objections, we'll get started again. Um, so thank you for coming in, Alicia, and I'm gonna let her introduce herself and talk a little bit about her request this year. All right, and so um, my name's Alicia Newell, and I serve as the um, Assistant Vice President for Assessment and Student Retention um, and Student Affairs, um, and um, second year in this role so excited to finally be able to um, get our um, kind of assess and evaluate some of the things that we're doing um, and set goals and things in motion um, primarily we focused a lot um, originally with um, providing the mental emotional um, support for students who um, present to be in some sort of um, crisis or just having issues or challenges um, around care team um, and looking at how we expand services and programs to provide support for students. Um, also looking at areas um, in need for student retention um, and trying to implement or beginning to implement programs and services for those students. Um, and excited to see that grow. Um, we recently added um, expanded our care team um, to include um, two new additional care coordinators. Um, if you look at our data within care team, um, we are up 178%, um, I believe it is, of care cases from this time last year. Um, and the year prior to that, we were up almost 300%. And so we're not seeing this as something that's going to kind of 
taper off anytime soon. Um, national data shows that students who exhibit um, some sort of mental health disorder um, graduating from high school is at a 48% that they've been diagnosed as a senior in high school. And so these are students who are coming in already with a diagnosis and how do we as an institution begin to wrap our, um, our arms around them and providing support. And so we're um, expanding um, some of the things we're doing with care team to be able to do that. Um, the increase that um, I'm asking for um, is simple within um, a salary within the position. And so the coordinator that we hired was an individual who um, had student affairs background um, and not really seeing the need of um, what care team and the services and some of the, the challenges our students were facing, we saw that we really had um, a different skill level needed for this role. Um, and so um, when the individual transitioned out of their role um, for um, other opportunities, and when we came to hire for this role, we saw that we needed someone who had actual case management and crisis background. We were very fortunate to hire Ashlyn Riley, um, who came to us from ComCare um, Crisis, and so she's seen the worst of the worst, and what we were seeing on campus uh, was nothing... Um, it was like, oh, that's it. Um, and so it was great to have someone with that skill level. So we did have to bring her in at a higher pay rate, um, which is what you're seeing in the request. Are there any questions for Alicia? Or is that all? Alicia? I don't know what else you want me to say. Uh, I, I, I <laughs> um, some, I guess some of the new programs that uh, we implemented um, with um, our funding is um, looking at student retention and really being able to focus on populations of students that are not matriculating here at the university. So we're looking at um, our Latino students, um, students who are first generation, students who are Sedgwick County but are non-residential, in addition to students who are parents. And so we implemented um, four interest group, um, first year interest group programs, um, and really trying to see how do we connect and engage with them before a problem arises, right? Um, and so with this, we're really um, excited to, uh, with, the HESA, with the implementation of the HESA program, the Higher Ed Student Affairs Master's program, of now getting graduate students who will be able to come in um, and help us facilitate and be more intentional with these groups, which um, our funding would help support. Um, in addition, uh, what additional duties can the care coordinators do in order of being proactive and going out and engaging with these populations before a crisis comes up and we can do some prevention work? Um, in addition is um, looking at mental health in general um, and trying to help destigmatize what that is. And so we implemented a new, um, a new program this year called Shocker Strong. Um, it's a resilience-based program where it's open to everybody. Uh, we meet once a month. We have m monthly messaging, weekly messaging, actually, that goes out. And it's when life happens, what do you do in order to pick yourself back up? How can you be mindful? Use mindfulness in your daily um, routine. And so being able to have um, our student assistants as well, grad, um, and our staff within care team help assist with that program as well. So, Thank you. Are there any questions for Alicia? Representative Paul. Hi. Um, so, quick question. What are your contractual services that you have that is line items like 2000s is what it's on, on page 152? Yeah. We are um, in the process of creating a student planner for our first year students um, or new students who come. Um, so making sure that when in assessing and looking at students um, this semester was one of the things that is kind of triggering them and not being able to manage time, being organized, um, is implementing a university-wide planner and giving that to them. And so this would be give issue to all students um, through new student orientation in the fall. Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, I had a question on page 151. There are three questions that weren't answered, and you answered number seven a little bit in your discussion, but can you provide us with a written response so we can have it in our complete record for uh, this particular fiscal year budget and everything for all of them? 
And can you also go over um, if you have any other funding sources and revenue? And can you also go over why you need to keep a reserve that's $84,000? Yeah, so one of the things that um, I've shared with Terry Lab regarding the reserved is that we, we have not been properly staffed in order to do the work that we've been tasked to do. And so if you look at the students um, within the university who have presented in crisis, we are essentially triaging students in crisis for CAPS. Um, the data, um, I'll share that with you in written response, um, clearly shows that the work that we're doing is triaging to where CAPS can provide more long-term immediate care for students who present in crisis or need that long-term care. And so we've not been able to do the work that we would like to do because we have not had the staff to do it. Um, so now that we just hired two additional coordinators to assist with care team, um, the expectation is is that this next academic year, this next um, fiscal year, is that that money would definitely be used in the programming and outreach initiatives that we um, will be doing with the proper staffing that we have now. So yes, I will get that to you. Representative James, did you have a question? Um, I was just going to ask, kind of like um, the other representative had said, um, for number six on page 151, if you had any other sources of revenue and... We do not. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, sorry. Rep 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 Representative Van. Um, do you mind explaining what the care team is exactly and also um, what services do they provide? Absolutely. Um, and so care team is, I like to say, um, the university is like angels on standby. Um, we wear capes, not really. Um, but um, essentially, um, it's a, um, a designated staff that is um, on standby to assist students of concern. And that could be students who um, may be absent from class. It could be students who exhibit suicidal ideation, health issues, homesickness, any number of things that would essentially get them off track um, academically. Um, and being able to be um, proactive and reaching out to them, a lot of times what we see is that a faculty member has identified that something's wrong or maybe a student wrote something in um, an essay or an exam or um, a paper um, that is concerning but they don't know how to address it with the individual and so they submit that to us and we reach out to them to see hey what's going on are there any issues or concerns that we can um, help you work through um, and so with that it's really looking at how do we connect them with with university current resources and so right now we partner um, hand in hand obviously with CAPS on campus um, they have had a significant increase of students who are utilizing um, counseling and prevention services simply by the referral of care team um, with this it's really it's a beautiful I say marriage partnership um, for the simple fact that um, we're able to work with them in, in creating a um, getting releases from them of saying hey did this student show up um, have they have you seen them um, and we're not just leaving it to the student to go but we're following up saying hey we we've noticed that you haven't been to counseling for a while what happened? Is it that you can't afford to pay $10 for your session? Um, do we need to call and help you with that? Um, is it medication? Are you are you not able to afford your medication? So let us help you find resources um, to help either get reduced uh, medication or look at community resources. And so not only is it referring students on campus and getting them connected and being very intentional with that, um, so I'm not gonna send someone over to Student Health without me calling student health or sending them an email saying, hey, I'm sending Alicia Newell to come and see you, they're gonna expect, and then they're also gonna report back, hey, Alicia showed up or Alicia didn't show up. And so, um, care team is really providing wraparound services for students, um, not just on academic, but personal, emotional, and social. And so it could be a student who's homesick from you know, I like to say we had a, a story as a student um, who was from Southwest Kansas, first generation college student. Um, he's sitting in a hallway and it's dark. And I'm like, hmm, that's odd, right? And then I go and I ask, you know, why are you sitting here? What's going on? And he was just like, I can't go back to my room. Um, there was microaggressions that his roommate were, were sharing. Um, and he was like, I just failed my first calc exam. And 
You know, all these things were happening. And then, you know, as we started talking, he started unloading all of these things. I said, well, why are you sitting here? And, you know, what's your number one thing that we need to address? And dad was just deported. And so he was sitting there because he didn't know who to go to to talk to about his issues and concerns, right? And so it's being able to say, okay, I've identified someone, we're talking to him. And this was just out of coincidence. But when I was engineering, I reported this individual to care team. And so care team was able to reach out and say, okay, what additional things can we do? Um, and contacting care team, um, they were able to help purchase his books um, and working with resources on campus to identify hey you don't have your books dad was deported let's work with you know financial aid to see what resources are available and so it's not putting a band-aid on things that need surgery it's truly addressing the problem that is causing the student to be in distress and so that's care team can, can I clarify something about the reserves so I was sitting here doing the math in my head and there is no way that this eighty-four thousand um, dollars is unspent money from the budget line. That what is this is a carry forward from. So we worked at. It, I don't, you can't see my hand. So there. So in this budget was Alicia's role and then Dr. Austin's role. Mm -hmm. And then what we work to do is, is separate him out of mm -hmm. of this budget and move him into the overall student affairs budget. And then. Mm -hmm. When he came out, there was um, some re residual uh, money that was reserves that had been collected through the years that didn't come to student affairs with him, but sat here. If we looked at the real reserves that she has from unspent dollars from last year, it will probably be $15,000 at most. <laughs> but much of this is just some historical money that's just been sitting around that she got to have it on her line, but she's not necessarily responsible for it to be what it is. Does that, does that make sense? And an, another clarification, right, on the reserve line is that it's a snapshot of a picture in time, right? So that doesn't look, oh, sorry, can you hear me? That doesn't look like what it looks like now, probably. Um, it's just, and especially when you have positions moved or yeah. something like that, mm -hmm. the, the snapshot can look very, very different from what the actual actuality is. So. And with this particular one, we moved a whole fund from 10-19-15, so Alicia's org, into Terry's org, 10-19-03. So if you look, this is a little bit higher, but um, also on Terry's reserve balance, 10-19-03, that money moved, and that's why hers is a little bit higher there than it showed in the original. So it's just some weird accounting stuff on the fund moving from one org to the other. So I promise you we're not being shifty. No. You know, that <laughs> as, as Lauren and I looked at it, really, if you look at the reserves for the student affairs, the D10-292, it's really about $27,000 in reserve, not 116. And same thing would be true of what's sitting in, in Alicia's, the student life one too. And the money moved after um, June 30th, but before now. So that's why you kind of see it here, and then you see it in Terry's number. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, uh, Vice President Berth. Hi, I'm Michael Berth, student body vice president. What I, you know, so I know a lot about the care team, uh, but my specific question is related to military veterans and first responders, because they kind of have their own thing going on. Uh, it re unfortunately relates to what the care team does uh, and is sometimes driven right into it. Uh, but I'm curious as to sometimes there are barriers, not physical ones, but uh, perceptions or stubbornness mm -hmm. uh, from individuals from those backgrounds of not wanting to talk to somebody that may not understand from that. So I'm wondering what kind of considerations uh, the care team and anyone else under your care, uh, to include new hires, have, you know, what you have taken for those. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, um, this is something that we actually were talking about this morning in a staff meeting um, is, you know, how do we provide those services to our, our student veterans who um, don't have that comfort level of coming and talking to someone who's a civilian and doesn't have that background. And so right now, without additional funding to actually bring someone on who has that background is we're looking at um, trying to work with the VA to create an MOU 
um, of being able to work with an individual who is there at the VA that the individuals are already connected with and just being able to say, help, let us know who they are so we can help provide additional resources, whether that's on campus or additional information in the community, similar to what we just created with um, Calm Care Community Crisis, um, because we have students, when we shut down, for example, um, for Christmas break, we have students who, who have daily contact with us. Um, so who's going to follow up with those individuals while the university is closed? And so um, being very intentional on who our partners are um, and really seeing, you know, are we providing those wraparound services? So if they're not coming to us, that's fine. We need to go to them and where they're at and making sure that we're creating those relationships. And so um, that's something that came up in our staff meeting today that we are um, beginning to work on. So my hope is by next year, we'll be able to get that finalized. Representative Stephanopoulos. Can you tell us what the acronym CARE stands for? Um, CARE is Crisis Assessment Response and Evaluation Team. Yes. Representative Hall. Hi again. Um, so are the coordinators, the CARE coordinators, a part of this budget or are they a separate entity? Okay, so one of them is. Um, the other is um, currently being funded by Housing and Residence Life, um, and another is being um, funded by um, Title Nine. Title Nine, right? Yep. Um, Title Nine. Well, and this, and yep. yep, and then part of um, our reserves. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you so much for coming in. Um, and again, if you have those answers for the reserve yep. questions, um, that would be great. And I Email can, that to who? To if you can email it to me yep. and okay. then just CC Gabe on it as well, okay. and we'll send it out to everyone. Yeah. Yep. Oh, it's sga.treasure.edu. Wichita.edu. Yeah. SGA.treasure? Uh huh. At okay. wichita.edu. Thanks for not grilling me too hard, y'all. Oh, of course. Yay. Did great. Thanks okay. for coming in. Yeah. recess for 10 minutes.
If no one objects, we're going to gavel back in. Thanks, guys. All right. So we have Scott Jensen from Student Conduct, and then Kyle, what's your last name? Wilson, from, also from Student Conduct. And they're going to tell us a little bit about the Student Conduct budget and their request for this year. So welcome, Scott and, Wilson, and Kyle. <laughs> So thank you all for having us here today. Um, what we're passing around now is a quick overview of some of the statistics of the cases that um, the Student Conduct and Community Standards Office has heard over the last year and a half or two. And there's a, a history over the past, I think, five years um, or four years. And what you can see in there is that uh, recently our office has been asked to facilitate the academic integrity process. Uh, which has greatly increased the amount of cases that we hear on an annual basis. And so previous to this year, and a lot of you have heard this when you came around and, and we chatted with you all, but this is for those of you who weren't present. Um, before last year, uh, there was not a, a specific academic integrity process that the university ran. Students would um, be accused of cheating within a class, be held accountable by that um, faculty member or instructor, and that was that. And uh, folks around the university thought it'd be a good idea for there to be due process when a student was accused of cheating. And what was realized is to have a process, you have to have someone facilitate it. And that has fallen on our office. And uh, it's, been a, it's been a great opportunity for us to be more involved with um, almost more on the student advocate side. Not that we're not always advocating for students, but really as we run the process, it's an opportunity for the, us to inform them of their rights within the academic integrity process. Um, and then we call together a group that basically they are the hearing officers and we're just recording the, the outcome of that case. But um, so as you can see, um, to transition over to our budget um, and the requests we have, uh, it's pretty much we, we have staff. Um, we do a little bit of development with them and then we do office supplies. We don't do a lot of other expenses. It's pretty bare bones. Um, but one of the things we're looking to add on a permanent basis is a graduate student. And so with the increase we have in caseload, we do see the need to add in some staff support for that. And we would prefer to do that through um, a graduate student route. So it, it is an applied learning opportunity for one of our graduate students um, going through our higher education program here on campus. And we view that as a great opportunity um, to elevate an experience for one of our graduate students. And so they, we, we've had one this year. Um, we are using reserve money that, is, that we have currently that'll pretty much be almost exhausted after this year by using some of our reserves to cover that position this year. Um, but we're hoping moving forward to cover it out of um, this increased request. My understanding is now I can stop talking and turn it over to you all. Um, thank you so much, Scott. Um, does anyone have any questions for Scott or Kyle? Uh, Senator Kirk. <clears throat> what exactly um, are the responsibilities of the um, graduate assistant that you have? Um, so that grad student um, does a lot of education and outreach for our office um, and so helps do presentations, whether that's at orientation um, for organizations around campus um, or just outreaching to students in the RSC for tabling events. Um, additionally, they are a hearing officer and so they do hear um, a lot of our academic integrity cases as well as a uh, large number of our conduct cases that we see through our office. Uh, but those are really the two primary responsibilities for them. Senator Kirk. So just to be clear, um, these <clears throat> these graduate student, uh, this graduate assistants, do they have any direct involvement, like involvement of say in these cases or no? So the when they are a conduct hearing officer, they they hear from the student, um, weigh all the information they have, and they make an outcome on conduct cases. For academic integrity, their job is to do an in, what we call um, an informational meeting with them, so they inform them of their rights and the choices they have moving forward in the process. Um, but our office as a whole does not have any um, say in the outcome or the decision on academic integrity. That's all 
the actual committee that Kyle works to pull together um, to hear those. Does that answer the question? Yes. Okay. Um, Vice President Berth. <clears throat> Hi, Michael Berth, student body vice president. Uh, so I see here on line, what is that, 5,000 for scholarships, uh, where you've added 5,000. Could you elaborate a little more on what that is? Yeah, essentially that's the salary of the graduate student. Um, can you tell us when, when the decision to hire on the graduate student was made or approximately when? Yeah, so last year as uh, the university was putting together the higher education and student affairs program, uh, different offices around student affairs looked at ways they could fold in opportunities for graduate assistantships and this office made a lot of sense in terms of uh, the experience we could give graduates, a graduate student, but as well as the increased workload we we're having and this being a good way to address that workload. So the short answer would have been um, about this time last year. Was it before the student fees process or after, do you know? It was before, we did put in a request last year. <coughs> Um, Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, what was the $100 increase in the contractual services? I'm not sure. Uh, can I have a follow-up question? Yes. Um, for the employee health insurance, it increased by uh, almost $7,000. Um, is that for the additional employees that you are taking on? Is that why you're requesting it? It's under fringe benefits, yeah, line no. items. So in, just really quick, uh -huh. in the adopted budget, um, because that it's like based on the employee's decision. So if previously an employee that was in that position or if it was vacant, it probably might show zero dollars. But if you have somebody in there that's making a health insurance selection, there'll be money in that line. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's my understanding is all of those things are determined by formulas used in, in their office. Um, I, I would not have entered that in there. Uh, and then my last question, for line item 1,110, um, it's $9,000. Does that refer back to the, the summer $9,000 salary position in item six of page 140? Or item seven of 140? Yeah, so essentially um, what our hope would be is we fund um, the, the graduate student salary during the year and then our hope is also to have opportunities over the summer. So we've hosted um, interns over the summer. So our, our salary line for graduate students would in, involve or include both the academic year as well as the summer opportunity as well. Any other questions? Yes, Representative Stephanopoulos. Can you explain what would happen if, let's say, funding wasn't granted and uh, your reserves run out? What happens to your department and how you deliver services? Um, we're, we would um, look at the priorities of the department and figure out um, where we might be able to make cuts in other areas to see if we could continue to fund the graduate position. Um, the other piece is I oversee both student housing and student conduct, and so we might look at trying to create a partnership between the two where we may have a position that overlaps both areas that might be partially funded by student housing if it came to that, try and get creative. Any other questions? Okay, well thank you for coming in, and thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you all, and good luck with the rest of your day.
Welcome in. Thank you for coming. Um, so this is formula team. It's on page 208 of your student fees binder. And I'm just going to have you introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about your request. Okay. I'm Justin Wireman. I'm a co-captain of Formula SAE. I'm Felipe Escalante, and I'm also the other co-captain of Formula SAE. So uh, just before we get started on the introduction for the team, I just want to clarify a few things just to help out. Um, we, you might hear us use the word shocker racing and Formula SAE interchangeably. Um, that's usually because about a couple years ago, uh, the two student organizations, Baja SAE and Formula SAE, decided to brand themselves together as Shocker Racing. This is just to help out into doing our community outreach to our publics. So, in that being said, uh, Formula SAE, our goal is to design a open-wheeled Formula SAE style race car. We do this by going through the engineering design process of designing, manufacturing, testing, and then at the end competing with the car. Uh, our other goal that we have as well is that we try to give our members real world experience in all these categories and not just in engineering but also in business and finance, marketing and communication as well. Uh, our team is divided into about, oh, is divided into eight sub teams and that includes chassis, suspension and brakes, uh, aero, composites, it'll be electrical, uh, cockpit and controls and then the last two will be powertrain and drivetrain. So these are the subsystems uh, that act, are actually formed the car, and this is how we manage to, you could say, to actually build the car within the actual team. Um, and like I said, at the end, our goal is to compete with the actual group uh, in terms of all these categories in engineering, marketing, and communication as well. So that's our introduction that we have. Um, sorry. Uh, Representative Hall. Hi. So um, you did not answer question number eight, which is please provide a current balance for your reserves to date and justify why you need those reserves. Mm -hmm. Currently, you have 29,841 from like what we have here. I don't know if you can provide more current numbers, um, but just being able to answer that question for us. Yeah. So when we first started this budget, we're, we're new to being co-captains and into the administration. We took this position around November. So we we're trying to get caught up in all the process of actually what it takes to run this team. Uh, to answer your question specifically about the reserves, um, I'm assuming it was you know self-explanatory reserves is some money that we had uh, to the side, uh, which is why in our goal, one of our goals that we wanted to do in terms of upgrading our computers, um, we are going to be dipping into that reserve cash hopefully this fiscal year. So I've, 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 I have a couple questions about your build cycle. So you're mm -hmm. currently on a two-year build cycle. Is that is that correct or are you? So for SR21, it is technically in a two-year build cycle, but we're trying to go back to our traditional one-year build cycle. The uh, reason why we went to a two-year build cycle for SR21 is because in the past we have had a full aero kit on our car, which um, unfortunately that type of knowledge of how to create with composites uh, went away once our members graduated. So we're tr we gave ourselves an extra year to see if we can actually go back and learn everything we need to do to make a really, you know, a, a really good race car, you could say. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Representative... Nara Moore. Hi. So um, a number of universities uh, across the country have sponsors that uh, help um, cover their budget, specifically the University of Kansas. Their budget, um, seven-eighths of their budget is covered by sponsors. I noticed on the web your website that you do have sponsorships. How do your sponsorships play into funding for your organization? So uh, usually our sponsors help us in providing a uh, service or some type of um, like uh, consumable. Uh, in this case, what you see here is uh, we have our carbon fiber rim. Uh, we do have some sponsors that we're trying to reach out to see currently right now if they can provide again that carbon fiber that we need to actually design this and also all the extra tooling that goes with it because this rim alone right now it, to actually manufacture it with a discounted rate that we had so far with our sponsors was about 2700 and that's just one rim. We need at least eight of these 
for both dry tires and wet tires as well on the car. So that's one way that our, our sponsors can help us out. Another way uh, in terms of service is uh, in helping with machining. So there are some really complicated uh, parts that, are, that we don't have the means to actually fabricate within our shop. So that is one, one route that they actually help us out with as well. Um, Representative Day. Yeah, this is somewhat similar to a previous question, but I was curious. Um, uh, aside from sponsorships and also through student fees, it looks like your entire budget comes from student fees. Um, do you have other means of raising money? So currently for this uh, fiscal year, we're trying to reach out to the Society of Automotive Engineers. Uh, that is one area that in the past uh, we kind of diverged in terms of communicating with them. From what I hear, there is some means that they can help us support monetary value-wise, but I can't tell you the exact amount, but that is one area that we're currently reaching as well. And another one that just came to mind was also Honda Motorsports. We're trying to reach out to them. So do you have any other direct forms of revenue outside of you know sp sponsorship for parts, or like do you advertise in the car and people pay for, your, like, pay for that or anything like that? Well, the majority of our sponsors, as Felipe was saying, they're trading kind. Okay. Most companies, they're a little more unwilling to give you money because that comes with a lot more paperwork, a lot more time on their end. What they're able to do is mostly provide services like machining, complex parts, providing surplus. Um, we do have a few sources of revenue. We have our own merchandise. Uh, we are getting a store set up with that. Mm -hmm. That's one way that we're starting to branch out into uh, actual monetary gains. Uh, Vice President Brady. Okay. Just, you started to go somewhere else. So I want to make sure I still had. No, you're good. So on that line, where we're talking about, sometimes you have to, you know, send something out, whether to get machined or some other service. Uh, do you have a breakdown on what you all do in-house and what that would extrapolate to money-wise versus what you contract out, if that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so our public relations officer, uh, one of the responsibilities he has is to also see uh, what's the monetary equivalent value of the service that our sponsor provides. And we also do try to keep a track of everything that we do purchase in-house in terms of uh, components. The only thing that we haven't got a chance to actually uh, get data for in the last couple of years was uh, man hours, of actually how long it, uh, how many hours it takes to build each car, and that is actually something we started this last year to start physically tracking with the help of uh, the College of Engineering. Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, <clears throat> on uh, question nine for page. 211, um, you say that your goal is to be within the top 20. What were the last three uh, placements for the that you guys were at? Okay. Um, so when the goal there is the top 20 in design, so the way our competition is breaking down to is uh, dynamic and static events. Uh, the static events include a business uh, presentation, a cost report, and also a design presentation. Uh, and then on the dynamic events, it mostly focuses on the aspects of the car, how well can accelerate, brake, and then, of course, our traditional autocross competition. Uh, but going back to your specific answer on the uh, design and what we have for our next uh, competition as a goal is uh, we're trying to see if we can place within the top 50th, top 40th of overall. Uh, last year, we took SR19 to Lincoln, Nebraska, which was the last time it was going to be hosted there. It actually got moved to California. Um, we placed around 65th out of 80th without a running car. So that there shows us exactly, you know, once we actually, well, we do have the car now running. So that gives us hope for this next competition where we compete in Michigan to place within that top 50th as our goal. Um, have you completely built the car this year? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, Representative Webb. Hi. Could you speak? Oh, I'm so sorry for touching your plate. Um, could you speak to how your organization um, impacts um, the students that are involved and how it might impact like internship, job opportunities, things like that? 
So, um, as mentioned before, our goal as a team is to provide our students with real world experience. So, something that we have in the shop is giving the chance to them go through, for example, an engineer, go learn the theory and the design in class, and then actually get a chance to apply it in actually building, well, in our case, a race car. Um, but again, that's not the only means that you know we try to provide to our students in terms of that. We also have communication majors. They help us out in terms of advertising, having their own campaigns, because you know, it's one thing to build a product, but if you can't market it right or show it to the public, then there's no support there. So we see that as a team, and that's why we're trying to reach out to multiple majors besides engineering in terms of uh, engineering and so, yeah, and engineering and, so, and whatnot. Um, and also to go back to what opportunities it can provide with internships, there are a variety of companies within the United States that actually look out specifically for uh, Formula SAE students. Uh, about once or two times out of, the, uh, out of each semester, we get contacted to our team email by these companies to see if anyone in our team is interested to apply for these internships. It kind of helps them up, get a leg up in terms of everyone else across the United States in that regards. To give you a little more on the specifics of how we provide benefits to our members in terms of getting internships in future careers in engineering, um, especially. Uh, so we have just done recently, we made a deal with uh, SolidWorks, that's the 3D modeling company we work with. Um, they are providing us with training, and that's um, certificates basically. So what we can do is we have SolidWorks available to all our members to learn, and that's all free. They can come in and learn on their own pace, in their own time, and then they can take a test provided by the company that makes the software as a certificate of you are able to use this software at a, and they have associate level and a professional level. And that is something you can put on a resume and you can show a company that I already have experience in SolidWorks, in 3D modeling, you don't have to spend as much time training me, that's a very valuable skill to have, especially as a new engineer. Uh, Vice President Bird. All right, so you started talking about memberships, uh, and that cued me into one that I had had written down. Uh, <clears throat> so as I understand it, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, all of your members are currently engineering students? Is that uh, correct? A majority are uh, engineering students. I uh, believe about four Four or three are communication majors, and the rest are engineering are students. And they vary from mechanical, electrical, aerospace, but they're mostly in the College of Engineering. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Representative Stephanopoulos. Um, on page 212 for the budget, uh, you have an $8,000 capital outlay. Can you tell me what that's going towards? Yeah. So. The purpose for the 8,000 is that uh, recently our computers are starting to fall behind in terms of they're getting the blue screen, we're having issues with components, and also the technology of those computers is not keeping up with our 3D CAD software and also for in our case for communication measures, the Adobe Photos, uh, Photo Suite. Um, the goal with those 8,000, if we're able to get it, it was it's going to go towards uh, actually purchasing a new computers for our whole entire lab. Our goal is to get around 10 new computers. We're currently in talks with Cybertron PC to see if they can help us out in terms of pricing and getting a discount. Uh, that's where we try to part, uh, we're also partnering up with them with, uh, with uh, Wichita State Foundation as well. So that 8,000 in capital outlay will go towards that goal. Uh, represent Representative Zacharias. Um, so in a previous question, you were asked about the reserves, and you were saying that would go towards buying the computers. Mm -hmm. So is the 8000 for purchasing the computers or up t like maintaining and upkeep? So 8000 and plus uh, part of the reserves will go into purchasing the computers. Uh, in the past, the computers that we have right now, we have upgraded them with the team money that we had before. But again, the issue is that the it's hardware limitation now is the point we're at. Uh, we were consulted with uh, SolidWorks. Again, that's our 3D CAD manufacturer. Uh, there's, there's a subdivision with them where they do bench testing, so with all the computer components. And we also got consulted with the College of Engineering in terms of that with the IT department. Uh, so the, the thought process we have is that uh, 
out of to purchase those ten computers, we budgeted to be about twenty thousand, and eight thousand of the capital outlay will go into that twenty thousand budget that we allocated, and the rest will come out out of the uh, reserves that we have. Uh, Representative Stephanopoulos. <laughs> Um, you said you're partnered with the WSU Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, does that come with any strings for about how you can do fundraising? Are you limited in certain ways on which donors you can approach and the kinds of things you can ask? Um, in terms of limited to donors, that would just, yeah, that would, that would mostly depend on who we're trying to approach. For example, recently we we're trying to start talks with Cybertron PC, so we have to make sure that we can verify with the College of Engineering that they're not currently pursuing something, you know, with them. And that their their idea there was to, you know, if we're all trying to get money from a certain company to help out, is why not ask them together to, you know, make it a bigger contribution overall? So that's one example that I've seen so far. But in terms of fundraising, we're currently not limited to anything. Uh, like I said, like Justin mentioned earlier, is that we're trying now to sell some merchandise, some team merchandise. And uh, currently we've been getting some help with safekeeping on that in terms of uh, making an e-commerce uh, store. Uh, President Miller. So looking at the year budget from 2019, the adopted budget from 2020, and then your budget request for 2021, um, it shows a pretty significant increase each year. Mm -hmm. So have you had conversations? Do you have any plans about potent, like ensuring that as years continue on, you're not continually asking for an increase for student fees? Mm -hmm. um, so this goes back to us trying to pursue and get have the conversation again with our sponsors. Uh, like I said before, we just took this role recently. Uh, before we were co-captains, we were still part of the team, but not in this process, you could say, of trying to get funds for the team. Um, I was a little bit with being the public relations officer, but in terms for future, uh, you could say, request of the budget for the SGA, is uh, originally back when the team started and up to uh, around 2012, can't remember for sure, but we had a budget around 66000 to 70000 So that was one area that we were trying to shoot, see if we could get back into uh, just to have it again. Because, uh, again, it, it takes uh, quite an amount of, uh, you could say, money to actually build this type of uh, race car. Yes. Yeah, I think their budget in, from 18 to 19. In 18, it was 66 k and in 19, it was cut to 49 so I think that was kind of the year there then do you know how much you spend traveling to the different competitions or what mm -hmm. sort of budget you have to outlay for that yeah so for uh, before of before this year our two main competitions were Lincoln Nebraska and Michigan those were two options we had for the formula SEE competition the Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, budget-wise, and how much it cost the team was around six thousand dollars, and to go to Michigan it was around eight thousand dollars. But since of since last year, the Formula SE decided to no longer have the Lincoln competition, and they moved it to uh, California. And that, when we did our budgeting for this year, that would be about uh, twelve thousand dollars, so about double of what Lincoln was. Representative Kirk. What money, if any, is given <clears throat> to you, your organization by the members? Uh, like mm -hmm. when you go, when you're going out to these two uh, mm -hmm. races, mm -hmm. um, what, how, if, uh, how much, if any, do they give? And just to clarify, you say to give to the specific competition? Okay. Um, so the way we have also structured the team is uh, we have two tiers of membership status. So when you first join in, you're a supporting member. Um, and then after a certain time period of three months, you become an active member. Once you have become an active member, we recommend that you join the SAE organization. And also what we do is we have a membership fee associated with being an active member. And with that fee, uh, it also covers the whole entire travel expense being, of course, an SAE member. And also, uh, we try to cover everything 
in terms of travel expense except for food. So that's that's our goal there. How much is that fee oh, uh, or membership fee? So our fee to the team is seventy dollars plus the SAE charges, which is around thirty from last time I heard. And then how many members again? We have about twenty active members and about ten supporting members. Representative Kirk. A follow-up question would be, um, you said you don't charge them for money. Do you, as a group, take care of that when you're there, or when you are there, or is this kind of like fend for yourself? In what regards do you mean? Um, so when you are at your these races, yeah. you said you don't charge the, your members for food, correct? Yeah. So when you're there, <clears throat> does your organization take care of the food itself, or do you just tell your members, like, go find food? So usually we try to eat as a team during competition. We know we try to stick together during those events. Um, but they're more than welcome to see, you know, there's a restaurant next to the one we're at. They're more than welcome to go eat there. But like, like I said before, the, uh, the food cost is on their side on trying to purchase it. Mm -hmm. Representative Kirk. All right. So I had forgotten where it was, so I was trying to look back for it. Uh, so under question seven, item four, you said the team can no longer test their vehicle on campus, but if I recall correctly from last year's uh, student fees process, you guys were trying to work mm -hmm. something out with the university. Can you explain uh, what the current stance is and mm -hmm. how you arrived at it? So uh, recently we met with the new general counsel. As I, like we mentioned before, we just took this new position. Um, Right now, she is looking into what the other universities that have Formula SA teams in the Kansas and Kansas are doing in terms of poly, of insurance, uh, just so we know for sure exactly of where we're covered. Because the biggest concern that what prevented us from actually training or actually using the car on campus was the insurance question, and that was initially proposed by the previous police chief, from my from my current understanding. So currently, right now, we're trying to see what is our options we have on the table compared to other universities, and then from there, we're going to go meet with the uh, police chief himself. What will be the cost of having to, do you know what the cost will be of having to test it off campus? Will there be any costs associated with that? Um, in terms of a specific number, I don't, can't recall it. I, I remember we did budget it uh, out for in this uh, proposal that we do. But mind you, when we go now to test our vehicle, we have to uh, drive to Jabara Airport. We have a uh, relationship with them with the manager that does Jabara Airport in Eisenhower. He has allowed us a strip of concrete to just test our vehicle there. So again, that's just fuel, getting the car out there, whatever brakes you could say. But mostly for testing, it's just the fuel cost. You could say. <coughs> uh, another area that we go into is in Hutchinson near Yoder, Kansas. There's an old uh, naval uh, airfield out there. And our, our one of our sponsors, the Wichita Regional SCCA Autocross Club, uh, hosts events out there, and they allow us to go out there and, and of course, compete and test the vehicle itself. If you were to able, if you were able to find that number, could you send it to um, Chair Osterman so mm -hmm. we can see that? Thank you. I mean, even if you just break it down by trip, you know, this is how much it takes us to get out there one time. Mm -hmm. That would, and, be, that would be helpful. Uh, right now, if I'd like to add as another note on that, is uh, we're trying to see if we can test at least, uh, is it twice a month or once a month? Uh, at least twice. Twice, yeah. Twice, twice a, month a month with the current build car. <laughs> of course, this number does change depending on what car we are testing and how close we are to competition time as well. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, um, last question, but Senator Ambrosia. Um, I was just wondering if is it standard to have all active members attend competition in formula teams? Well, the only people that are required to attend competition are the design leads, and that's because we have to present our designs to the judges. However, we always make it a goal to take as many people as we can, specifically of our active members. The only reason that w they would not be able to go is if they just couldn't make it because they have some other commitment going on. And if that is the case, then we generally try to fill their slot with a non-active member or somebody who would like to go but doesn't meet the qualifications on a normal situation, if that makes sense. 
All right. Thank you so much for coming in and for presenting. Yes. Um, I actually have one question, if mm -hmm. you don't mind answering it. So um, we know we have the reserves, but the thing is, as a team, we don't know how to access those reserves. So how do we access the reserves, basically, is my question. <laughs> So when they say reserves and on here, I think it's just the balance that was carried forward from last year to this year. So I imagine that you probably already have access okay, to that. Okay, so them. it's already yeah, figured it's to just the ones. all in that okay. same pot. That makes sense. It's mostly, you know, like of that money that you carried forward, okay. did you spend any of it on things that you needed okay. or like has it depleted in some way yeah. because you've... Yeah. Okay. Or has it grown because you didn't spend money on something that you were allocated to spend mm -hmm. money on last year? Okay, yeah, that was just my biggest yep. question. It was a separate yep. account or was just carried over to our remaining balance. But yep. All right, thank you. Thank you. So do we deliberate after this, Gabe, or is there, are, we, are we done for the day? Done for the day? Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. If you have any questions. Yeah, good job. So just a reminder, we will resume again tomorrow at 1 o'clock back inside this space. Try to be here a little early. Okay. Yeah. At 4.18. There you go.